swear, my dear, my Gertrude, I am not like the other legless terrorists. When I looked into her eyes as they dribbled down her cheek, I knew I'd found her. The girl that made me weak. Every other love I'd found only led to frustration. I needed a girl that I could love like I love my nation. I thought I'd live alone in a sad crippled pile. I never thought that I'd find an invalid francophile. She's my favorite girl without a skull. I won't break apart your artificial heart. I love Just podcast. We are on episode 28. I don't know why I thought it was later than that. Yeah. Episode 28, pages 809 to 845, with returning guest Paul Dykeman. I had such a good time with Paul last time. I thought I'd invite him on. I uh, back on. I have not conducted that interview yet. Uh, this is the night before. Having a very lazy weekend here for a very specific reason. I was exposed. Not the old-fashioned, not the classic way. I was not exposed by an old man in a naked under an overcoat. Actually, I was exposed a few years ago. You want to hear this shit? So, um, my sister's biological father, I'm not going to get into it any deeper than that. My sister's biological father is a real piece of shit. He got my phone number from somebody before. I don't know where. We had some discussion. This is when my sister was having some troubles. He had gotten my phone number from somewhere before, and we'd had a discussion. And then another time, I just texted him on the blue, like, hey, have you seen such and such my sister? He said no. And then he sent back a dick pic. And uh, when I said, what the fuck? He said, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I thought you were one of her friends. Like, oh, so you thought I was one of her friends, which was why when I was concerned about her, you said no. But would a picture of my dick help? Will that find her? Will that get her off heroin, maybe? No. Oh, that piece of shit. Please please don't tell her. Like, dude, I don't need to tell her. I'm just going to punch you in the face if I ever fucking see you again, you piece of shit. Maybe this is why my father had to raise your daughter, you druggy piece of shit. No, I was exposed the newfangled modern way. Uh, my lovely fiancé, Perry... Uh, just started a new job, but she had to finish up her last day at her old job. We, She has not been in the office for eight months. She's been working from home. Last day, she had to come in. She had to return her laptop and say her goodbyes to people. And turns out her fucking boss, who didn't have a mask on, prick, had fucking COVID. So the one time she steps in this office, she got exposed to somebody who definitely had it. Wear your fucking masks, people. Especially if you own... Uh, just... Don't be, don't be dicks. I'm so fucking sick of this. So we're stuck indoors until, uh, until that shit comes through. Trying to think of stuff. I, I have a few bit of news this week. Um, so I put up the poll. I realized I put up the poll a little bit too early, but so what we're going to do is going to, uh, after we are done infinite jest here are the plans for the next few weeks. I believe our final episode reading the book is December 20th. After that, I want to do a summary episode. Then, we might take a week off because it's New Year's, so why not? After that, we're going to have a buffer episode because eventually I want this podcast to become a little more, uh, just just more well-rounded. Guys, the worst thing about this podcast is having to track down the guests. So, I'm going to try to have more well-rounded stuff that I can have people on more easily. And that's why that first Buffer episode, I'm going to have... I actually haven't confirmed with him yet. Fuck it. You know what? I dare him to cancel on me after I haven't even asked. Uh, comedian friend Aaron Bell. I'm going to try to have him on and we're going to talk about Napoleon Dynamite. Something I've mentioned a few times 
on this podcast just because it was much like Infinite Jest. It was something I didn't even understand the appeal. The difference being with Napoleon Dynamite. Imagine something you don't like, like, eh, that, you know, you heard a lot about like, oh, this movie's so great. You go see it and then you're like, eh, you know what? Not the movie for me. It's fine. I found it kind of annoying, but whatever. I'm just going to go on with my life. Only I was in high school when that movie came out. And you know how high schoolers communicate with each other when they have nothing to say yet? They quote movies that they like. So imagine the worst movie you've ever seen. And it wasn't the worst. All right, imagine a horrible movie you didn't like. And then your entire peer group is speaking exclusively in quotes from that movie for six fucking months. I have a problem with Napoleon Dynamite. After that, because it was voted on and because I don't want to lose my literary audience yet, we're going to be doing much the same thing we have now, 30 pages at a time, bringing on people from the community. We're going to be doing Thomas Pinchon's The Crying of Lot 49. Oh, that's going to be... that's good. I, I Unlike Infinite Jest, I have no negative connotations of that book. I just know it's kind of difficult, but I don't know. We'll see. Um... I think it's going to be a long time before I take on a project as big as Infinite Jest. It took six months. With the rest of this podcast, I'll here. I'll read you some ideas I have. And you know what? Write into me at Jesse Dram on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, now on Reddit. I started a parlor. Why? Because I just felt like trolling right wing douchebags. Send me a message on parlor. That's fine. Uh, or at jessedram at gmail.com. Here are some ideas I have for episodes coming up. Napoleon Dynamite, Eminem, Libertarianism, Communism, Anarchism, Furries, U2, Fuck U2, God, I hate it, Anime, Tim and Eric, Bruce Springsteen, he sucks. What's certainly going to be a series, guys, I almost just made this this entire uh, podcast from here. I hate the Bible. I'm, I'm going to do that by bits and chunks. Obviously, start with Genesis, but like, oh, God. Guys, you know what kind of sense of humor we have around here. Can you imagine me shitting on Deuteronomy for a few weeks? That'll be fun. But, yeah, if you have any topic ideas, we're, we're, looking, for, we're looking for things that are beloved, but maybe don't get the criticism they deserve. Bruce Springsteen. Dude, fuck Bruce Springsteen. I will say it and I will mean it. Leonard Skinner are better songwriters than Bruce Springsteen ever was. You know, it's funny. Somebody commented, uh, shared the podcast on Twitter this week, and they said, this, uh, this podcast is everything I love. It is dunking on pretentious people and people from the Jersey Shore. Which I appreciated that. Not from the Jersey Shore. Spent a lot of time down there. Uh, I say I'm from Belmar multiple times. There's a Shore Belmar and then there's a Southern Philly Belmar. And that is where I am from. But much appreciated. You know, it's all about the Jersey Shore. I think my girlfriend's watching Jersey Shore in the other room. My fiance, I mean. Actually, no, I mean my girlfriend. I haven't proposed to that girlfriend yet. Did I mention I'm in a thruple? Haven't had her on yet. (laughs) No, they're just both named Perry Lerner. That's what happened. I had one Perry Lerner on forever ago, and then I had to have the other Perry Lerner on because she was getting jealous. Ugh, thruples. Am I right, guys? Um. So, yeah, some attention this week. There's a guy, there's some people on Reddit that fucking hate me. Uh, I could have done this better. I posted this week's episode because I had Perry on. I just posted it as how to explain infinite jest to your girlfriend. And I wasn't trying to be a dickhead. I was trying. I was making fun of the stereotype of people who love Infinite Jest, telling women they need to read it. And then I was in a position where, because I didn't want the Kevin Hufe episode again. Guys, I love Kevin Hufe, but that that was my fault. I had him just read the chapter. No idea what the rest of the book was. But I needed somebody last minute. I had another cancellation. My guest got stuck in rural Georgia with no Wi-Fi. But so, yeah, so I had to explain to her the context as I went along. A lot of people didn't like that fucking post. A lot of people, you know, why the fuck are you even posting here anymore? But not the majority because it still had positive upvotes on Reddit. Reddit's a hellhole. Avoid it if you can have. But one guy, I don't remember his name, was like Mo Bees or something like that, has just been commenting like, respect David Foster Wallace. You're a moron. Fuck you, you piece of shit. And, ah, uh, guys... Here's the thing. This is the best thing about doing comedy. I recommend anybody try it for a little bit. Unless I look up to you or know you personally, you cannot hurt my feelings. Because, yes, you know what? I did. Part of this podcast is definitely, like, you know, 
uh, am I too dumb to understand this? Which I know I'm not, but it's always that, you know, the only thing I've ever really had is my intelligence. As I, you know, I come from lower class stock and that was the one thing that made me different. And I have had moments like, oh no, maybe I am dumb as shit. Is this like Dunning-Kruger effect? Wait, would a smart person, would a dumb person know what Dunning-Kruger effect is? I don't know. I'm watching Beavis and Butthead. Is this making me dumber? Let's see if Friends is on. No, Friends is definitely the wrong direction. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that sensitivity does not apply to me. Some dickhead on Reddit cannot criticize me. on. They can criticize me all they want. I just don't care. You know, you're making yourself look bad. Um, one other thing happened this week, and uh, we're going to get serious here. Going to take a swig of water. Swig of water for the working man. Um, I'm. I don't want to do this to be uh, self-aggrandizing. I I do kind of want to do this as a PSA, and as it's something that obviously is always going to come up with David Foster Wallace. Um, I'll give the too long don't read version. I may have prevented somebody from killing themselves this week. Longer version. So. Again, this is PSA because I want to make sure you guys know, like, the, the suicide Heimlich maneuver, basically. Uh, late Monday or Tuesday night, it was also after midnight, so it was technically the next day of whatever day that was. I'm up a little late. We just found out about the COVID exposure that day. Um, up later than I should have. It's 1.45 in the morning. I'm almost always in bed by 1.30. But I'm fucking around on Facebook. And I pass by and I see somebody who I'm friends with, but I don't know. I don't know how I know them. I just know we have a bunch of comedian friends in common. And they had posted Goodbye World. Uh, And most importantly, had only posted it about 10 minutes before when I saw it. So this person, again, I don't know this person, but a lot of people are starting to comment on the thread. Some people are being stupid like, you know, see you later, mommy. You fuck. Fucking idiots. Um, I uh, I just start commenting on there like, yo, if anybody... Because they also did the thing where they had the first and middle name, didn't have their last name. Smart, typically on Facebook. Not so good when we're trying to keep you from killing yourself. Uh, so I said, like, if anybody knows this girl's real name or has her number or knows her address, like, they should call her or, more importantly, call 911 right away. And uh, nobody seems to know. This seems like a girl who probably friends a lot of people on Facebook. But, so I start going into overdrive on this. I'm sending messages to people who appear to be uh, her family. on Because, you know, some of them have listed. And I take a wild swing and I start sending some messages to people she has tagged in photos with. And one man gets back to me. Pretty much like I just got all... It's... It's past 2 o'clock in the morning so far, so it's been almost a half hour since she posted this. This guy messaged me back like, I just got off of work. Dude, who is, is this a, this better not be a fucking prank. She's like, guy, I don't, I don't know this girl, but it's, uh, and this is the important background here. I have had this happen twice before. I've had people I've known kill themselves, one of which was a kid I went to elementary school with. Didn't happen in elementary school, that would have been extra tragic, but, uh. I just saw on Facebook one day, popped up in my feed due to the algorithm, he had just done one of those text photos. It was a few days before Christmas, and all it said was, sorry. And you look back at the guy's timeline, and it was a lot of distress over a recent breakup and, you know, feeling alone in the world, like every 20 minutes posting, and then the last one was just sorry. And then he went to his garage and hung himself, I believe. Uh also, a friend, both these guys named Matt, funnily enough, Matt, uh, no, I don't need to say their name, but an old friend of ours that we'd done some films with back in the day, and we just knew, we knew he was an orphan, we knew he was living alone, never seemed the guy, like, he was, he was a cool guy, as a matter of fact, I remember back when he and I were, I guess as close as we were, we actually, you know, butted heads, you know, bumped chests a little bit, because he was, you know, a little, little, little bro but generally a good guy. He uh, he messaged our mutual friend Joey, just like, "Hey, bud, um, you know, can we hang tonight? I'm really, you know, I'm not a, 
I'm really bored. I'm looking for something to do. And my buddy, unfortunately, had to blow him off. Like, oh, I'm taking I'm taking my mom out to dinner for, uh, I think it was like her wedding anniversary. Uh, her deceased husband. So now her children take her out on that anniversary. So he's like, oh, yeah, sorry, bud. I'll, you know, I'll get back to you tomorrow. He says, oh, okay. Messages him tomorrow. Never gets a response. Messages him again. Never gets a response. Uh, that Matt also hung himself. They found him in his house two weeks later. I had nobody... Uh, Again, he lived alone, so nobody to come to check on him. Very, very sad. And I tell those stories pretty much to show that when somebody on Facebook puts goodbye world, even if it's somebody I don't know, like, something needs to be done. Like, take that shit serious. At worst case scenario, like, they'll be really, really embarrassed when somebody takes it seriously. And it's like, I just meant good night. It was like, good night moon. I don't know what the fuck your deal is. But uh, this guy I got a hold of. Had her real last name, so I messaged some more people that I could tell were probably related. Her real last name, her, just the town she lived in, and her cell phone number. That was all she had, but took a gamble, called 911, and uh, those three bits of information got somebody to her house. So I went to bed that night at like 2.30 after scrambling around, not knowing what would come of all this. I woke up. And uh, here, I'm going to pull up the exact thing. The next day I woke up and checked Facebook. And uh, with the Goodbye World still underneath of it, the one on top just said, I did not expect to wake up this morning. I am alive. Whoever called 911, thank you. It saved my life. So there's, there's my good deed for a little bit. And again, I'm not I'm not telling this to aggrandize myself. I'm uh, frankly just as impressed that I could have. <laughs> that's not the word to fucking use. I listen. Not doing this to aggrandize myself, but uh, I impressed even myself on this one. But how many lives have you saved recently? Just saying. Oh, you donated blood. Fuck you. <laughs> no. Um. Astonished was the word, not that like, ooh, I did this great thing, but that uh, I actually did manage to interject in this, that a few people managed to interject in this and really made a difference and stopped this before it could happen. With it. This is somebody I had no information on. It was more like, uh... so anyway, yeah, if you ever see that on... Uh... If you ever see that on Facebook, somebody posts something suicidal, a little scary, and you can't get a hold of them. If if you have their town, their cell, and their name, like call nine one one, they will they will get there. They'll figure it out. And uh, yeah, everybody, you know, they've done a lot of interviews with people who have jumped off of bridges before, trying to kill themselves. Pretty much anybody who survives suicide, they, to a man and woman, when interviewed after they, have, if they have survived suicide, they have said after that, uh, when everything was in motion, too quick to stop it, they had immediate regret. People who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and lived, who said like, as soon as I let go, I thought, oh fuck, this isn't what I want. So. Killing yourself is never the answer. This is, of course, not a judgment on on Dave. He writes, uh, you know, I, even if I am liking the book, just for the name of the podcast, I'll be respectful and say Mr. Wallace. Uh, you know, Mr. Wallace was a different thing. Super tragic, the fact that he'd had medication that was working for a long time and had to get off it, and then... When he went back on, it wasn't working the same anymore, and he had that that black cloud, that that burning building sensation that he writes about so eloquently in the book. It's uh, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna ask anybody to suffer, you know, suffer another day on my account, but at the same time, it's uh, the reviews we have on suicide are not that good. Two stars tops. So, leave it at that. A little somber, long intro this week. I hope you guys liked that song about Marat. Um, 
Yeah, we're not coming back from the suicide thing. Guys, episode 28, Paul Dykeman. Whatever pages I said to whatever page. Look, look down at your phone. Look at your computer. It's right there in the title. So go check it out. A few more weeks, guys. Send me your messages. Anything, uh, whether it be art or subcultures or anything, you know, any anything to look at with a, with a critical eye that either you want me to have a guest on to talk with and break it down a little, try to figure stuff out. Send me a message. We'll see. This is Jesse Duran. Everybody, uh, stay safe out there. 99% of you, the world's better off with you. The girl that made me weak Every other love i found Only led to frustration I needed a girl that I could love Like I love my nation I, thought I'd I hate it, it just episode 28, while. pages 809 to 845, returning conquering guest, Paul Dykeman. How are you, my friend? I am a okay considering the world as it is. I'm doing all right. How about you? How are you doing, Jesse, this week? Uh, I'm doing, I, we, uh, me and my fiance had a COVID exposure this week. So we have been <sighs> indoors. We're, yeah. we're almost certainly fine. We both feel fine. We're just waiting on tests. My test came back, but then we realized after the fact, like, oh, she was the main exposee. I probably, even if she got it, I wouldn't have gotten it yet. So Yeah. And so this was a real exposure. Like this person is a confirmed case. Cause there's the, like two. This was a, she had, she had her last day of work. She started a new job. She had, hasn't been in the office in eight months. She had to go in and return her laptop and just say goodbyes to people. And her fucking head boss who did not have a goddamn mask on found out two days later, like, Oh yeah, that, that those sniffles I've been having, I had full blown fucking COVID. Oh God. So. See, because there's like two, there's also two levels of these horrific exposure events. There's one I've had, I've had at this point three times where someone was like, I've had to get a test because I had a fever. I had to go to a doctor and I've been told to tell all my contacts to isolate. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. So three times now I've had to isolate and I didn't have an actual contact who had had it. Mm -hmm. And then there was a fourth time where someone had actually had it. So I've had like four of these sequences you're going through right now, God. which is awful. It takes so much time. Dude, I only had two book shows this entire month. They both got canceled due to COVID shit. It's I saw you post about that, and I'm really sorry. That's it's just it, I mean the whole situation is so rough. I'm so sorry that like it's just not it's not shaking out well. For it me. happens. I have I have such a great new bit making fun of Italians, and I can't. I I have nowhere. It it just comes across as hate speech on the internet. So. <laughs> And, you know, there's just too much of that. So it doesn't stand out enough. Yeah. Oh, God. All I all I have to say is it includes the line of uh, eh, fuck it. I'll give the gist. I have this yeah, whole thing it. on just how Italians like a lot of Italians are racist. Yet when you think about it, a lot of like I, I make the argument like Italians have only been white for a few weeks now, really, if we think about it. <laughs> In the history of time, you mean. And the you talk about all, all the terrible Italian role models there are, Frank Sinatra, mm. Rocky. The only the only good guy that Italians look up to is Jesus. And guess what? Murdered by Italians. <laughs> and then I might have something in there about defunding the Centurions. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, I feel like you could do a whole lot of bits about yeah Rome mm -hmm. being something that they look up to and being a... Uh, like a horrific monster empire that mm -hmm. is like the the perfect example of a monster empire. I, I don't know what the joke is, but there's something oh, dude, there. Before we get too far, uh, let us yes. know what you're working on, where we can find you oh, on social yeah. media. Sure. So uh, you can find the podcast I make, which is an improv long form podcast. Uh, it's called The Offer Original Stories. You can go to theoffercast.com to find our latest episode. Uh, and you can find our Facebook and Instagram all under various like The Offer Cast or The Offer Pod. I think it's mostly The Offer Cast is how we've branded it. Um, although I got to say, as far as branding goes, I am an absolute novice. So, it, mm. you know, I'm, it's it's a real mess out there with my offer branding. Find it, find it out. Also on YouTube, you can watch us as we improvise through it. We record the video and, and do all that. Okay, so. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, we, I'm, we've got I, sound effects now, which is the big uh, I've, yeah. I've worked in an editor and he's put in music and sound effects. And it's been a wonderful experience doing that collab. I know a lot of people look down on that as almost cheesy, but as a fan of like old radio, I love a goddamn soundboard. That's exactly what my thought is, is like we're sort of doing an improvised audio drama. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> that's sort of the idea. Nice. Anyway, yeah. Dude, so that's that, the offer podcast. Check it out. Okay. Yeah. That that branding thing comes around. Like uh, I only recently I tried to consolidate everything just under the name Jesse Dram, but mm. then like some stuff it's like I would have to. Uh, pretty much download and then re-upload everything on YouTube. And I just don't care that much. Yeah. It's well, and also it's, it's always better to be making new stuff rather exactly. than like working on the backlog, like just be like, okay, from here forward, this is the way I'll brand and right. it's new and it's exciting. And then when you have a, an, a low time, you could look into the archives and post some stuff then. but just mm. doing it in bulk. I also find overwhelming. It's like, do I have to sit down and just like, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a slog. It's it's a slog, and it just it doesn't feel as joyous as the making of new stuff. And so I mm. think creatives tend to move away from it because we're not archivists. We're just not. <laughs> it's not our thing. Dude, this is an argument I've had. There has been some psycho from my past that uh, me and some friends used to make like independent films with, who mm. has come up out of nowhere, like creepily sen sending messages to like our friend's sixteen-year-old niece that he's known since she was four, shit like that. Oof. But yeah. his whole thing is like, hey, that that movie we made 13 years ago, somebody wants to buy it, which is not fucking true. But he like he yeah. needs something from everyone now. And this guy is like people talk about this guy the way they talk about like a terrible addiction they got over. Nobody talks oh. to this guy anymore. Wow. And uh, he messaged me because he needed a song I wrote for the movie. And I was just like, dude, fuck off. I'm, I, I'm done. And he went on this whole thing. Like, so you're not a real artist. You don't understand. Like, dude, you wrote a rom-com 13 years ago and I'm writing songs every week for a book. I don't even like what the fuck are you talking about? But again, this is the, I feel like there's a lot of people who get hung up on the idea of being an artist as opposed to actually doing the creative lifting. That's like this agree. immediately reminded me of that like, dude, you're still like tinkering with something from 13 years ago that wasn't good in the first place. Like, yeah, why? just redo it. Re like if you if you think there's something interesting about it, remake it and get new stuff. And and it's and yeah, this this obsession with holding on to old stuff is, I think, uh, a result of sort of the way the influence of principles of capital on our ideas of culture. Cause they think of like, I have this resource now that I've made this thing and I can make money mm -hmm. off of this resource. And that's not really how art works. Art, like what is most exciting is brand new and it depreciates very quickly. Yeah. Like it's, it's very hard to be like this thing from 13 years ago. It's great. It very rarely is. And the things that are, are like incredible rare examples. So it's, mm -hmm. but we think about it like I have this thing and therefore I can make money off of it. And it's kind of a mistake mm -hmm. of the way capitalism has influenced our thoughts about how art oh, yeah. should work. No, it's almost, it's almost like an oil rig that like you yeah. got three drops of oil from a decade ago, but you're like, but I already put all this money into the rig. Why would I start it? It got oil once. Surely it's a matter of time. Yeah. And just the thing I would encourage everybody to do is just focus on like the real resource is your creative well. You're like mm -hmm. the creative well that you have to make new stuff. The stuff you have made is dead and severed from you. Mm -hmm. You are the resource and tap into that. That's that's what I would tell everybody to do. So that is still the best thing that happened in comedy in the last 10 years was it finally became the thing like don't tell the same jokes over and over again. Burn your shit. Start anew. Yeah, this like sort of like every special is full of do jokes, right? Like, mm -hmm. and there are some there are some greats who do sort of seem to go back to certain jokes, but almost we almost don't need to anymore because they all exist. They're all accessible, so you can always go listen to the jokes from before, and you can still mm -hmm. have a great laugh at them. Right. But the thing that generates the most interest is like uh, the new thing that this comedian has done, and here it is. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's yeah, not it's like a, it's, it's not like back in the day where like if you wanted to hear the seven dirty words, but you would have to listen to a record or, or nothing else, as opposed to now you could pull up like different versions of that across a period of 20 years. There's no reason you need to hear it live. Yeah, there's there's this week's ray of sunshine. The Internet is making comedy better. Look at mm -hmm. that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before we started, you and I started talking about how uh, the DFW. On my list. On my list of what we have to talk about today, like two two things above the actual chapter itself is what what is going on with the Infinite Jest group of fans? And again, I don't <laughs> think it's all of them because there are I think there are a lot of people like me who are more in this camp that I imagine that if someone if Infinite Jest comes up, I'm always more like, yeah, I like it. We don't have to talk about it. I think it's really great. But like, you know, like I'm sort of I'm sort of embarrassed by how much I like it which I think is generally the better group of the, the fandom right there. Mm -hmm. And there's this other section, I would say probably the smaller one, that are something else entirely. And you were telling me about your run-ins with them this week. And I, I, think, I think the listeners should hear about well, there's a danger in liking this book too much or being too yes. uh, 
fascist about what the book is. And so I, I wanted to hear about you, from you about well, your experience of it. I, th I think there's a few things involved. One of, uh, one of which is the fact that I feel like a lot of the canceling that David Foster Wallace got in the last few years mm. has made a lot of people like he's not here to defend himself. So I'm going to jump in and do it, mm. which I mm. get. I, I, I understand that impulse to a certain yeah. degree. But uh, I think a lot of people, it, it's funny that people who read an 1100 page book and make all these theories about it have one interpretation of what a podcast called I Hate Infinite Jest is all about. Yeah. They will bend yeah, they over. They can't see through. Yeah. Yes. They will bend over backwards to explain why David Crone's spider walking is fucking genius. I hate I hated that in this chapter so much. They will bend over. Actually, it's an allusion to the spider as referred to as Don Gately, symbolizing his addiction. But any any new any criticism is nothing but sheer hatred with no nuance whatsoever. Um, mm. Here was my big fuck up. I always uh, post a link in the Infinite Jest subreddit and the David Foster Wallace subreddit. Yeah. And sometimes they like me, sometimes they don't. But mm -hmm. uh, last week, because I had another cancellation and I threw my fiance on at the very last minute, I <laughs> subtitled the episode, How to Explain Infinite Jest to Your Girlfriend. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Which I, I, <laughs> I, I found funny because of the reputation of David Foster Wallace fans. And also that because my girlfriend had not read the book, I literally had to explain all the context as I went. Yeah. But who, boy, did people come after me. Uh, one just said, uh, no. respect the memory of David Foster Wallace, you fucking moron piece of shit. Wow. Ugh. God. And uh, so what do you think had upset them that you were explaining it to a to the girlfriend? Like, what what was it that, like, triggered this thing? I think a lot of them have just hated that I've been po every now and again. I'll get something on that page of like, you know, you don't have to promote every episode here. And it, it's always that mm. like, well, guys, I, I know you haven't done anything creative, maybe, but like you need to promote the shit. A big mm. thing a lot of people need to get over is you need to be like a scummy like. Because it does feel scummy. Like, hey, listen to this fucking thing I made and then just blasting it everywhere because that's the only way that's the only way it gets seen. And it's a little yeah. gross. But like the people that are posting this, like, you don't need to post this here every week. Like, guys, I'm I'm like one sixth of all the posts here. Like you guys are not you guys aren't having enough conversation. I'm, and I'm not getting in the way of that conversation. I'm just. That's also very important. Like, it's not it's not that you're spamming it, which does get in the way of other conversations happening. Like, it's a once weekly thing. But and it's really interesting that some, there are these sections of Reddit that sort of feel like, oh, we don't want to see that again. And or that that would cloud their the I don't know. I have no idea why, because there's different sections of Reddit where there's some people are welcome things posting every week and then mm -hmm. other sections where it's not. And honestly, if they really as a community want to change that rule, they should like speak to their moderators because Reddit has a system for that. And the moderators yeah. obviously Obviously, think you are not breaking any of the red the subreddit's rules. Yeah, exactly. Right? And uh, that, that's why I said to the guy, like, downvote me if you want, send a message to the mods to ban me. But like, why am I going to not promote my podcast because somebody who doesn't like it anyway is complaining yeah. about it, you know? Yeah. So I've gotten I've gotten some hate mail this week. The the one guy I read the, the guy I posted on uh I, I screenshotted and mm -hmm. put it on social media. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think I replied to that, right? Yeah. When I replied to, yeah. Yes, exactly. But it, he and I had a decent conversation after. It's a lot of, okay. uh, it's unfortunately the title. The, the title is provocative and mm. uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think, I don't know. I Because I, I, I guess it's because they can't quite see through that you, that that is a, what you're essentially what you've done is frame sort of a critical lens of approaching the book, right? Which is super useful because if you just go at it, like I'm going to read this book and it's going to be amazing. I don't know. I don't think I'm really interested in that person's opinion, right? It's much more interesting to see the person who's sort of like struggling their way through it saying like, this stuff is really good. This other stuff is, you know, is like, as you said, like this section is kind of dated or like, like you've said, like these things don't hold up so well right. anymore. Right. Like it's really helpful to have that lens because I think it helps uh, contextualize the book and why the community is just, I mean, it really what it comes down to is a deep insecurity that the book is good because if they were yeah. sure the book was good, they would be like, oh, he's going to read it and he's going to change his mind. 
or whatever, <laughs> right? Like, but instead they have this incredible fear that that examination from that angle will will mean that it'll be bad. And mm -hmm. so it, it is a shame. The one thing that was also really interesting, I think that I wanted to bring up is that in, I replied to your, one of your threads about what that guy had posted. And I think somebody else, a random other person came in with like a pop quiz that he thought was, was insightful. Uh, and he said something about if, if I remember correctly, is Lyle a Wraith pop quiz? Oh, that and, fucking, I, I have no idea who that guy is. He came in out of nowhere. He's a random, he's a figurant, right? Coming in just right. to be like, I have insight that you don't have. And mm -hmm. I, I, I took issue with it for a couple of reasons. I mean, not real issue, because it's like, okay, this is an interesting thing I might have missed. But there's this thing that I think people miss about the book. They think that the book is in all of these like crazy, like random details that like if you could remember all the details of like, oh, this on this one page is a footnote that means this and therefore this is this. I don't really think the meaning of the book is bound up in those details. That's just flair that David Foster Wallace is using to like yeah. eventually get around to make his core point, which is like, if not simply said, is a very like it lacks a bunch of frills and details what he's getting at and mm -hmm. they just seem to have missed what the book is really about in favor of like noticing all the hilarious details there's a lot of people who are kind of taking like a bible code approach to this book yeah and as if contained in each line is mm -hmm. the exact absolute truth See, which... it's it's funny that as i've gotten further in the book and warmed up to a, at least parts of it i like a lot but mm -hmm. The latter, this this deep into the into the book, like the two minute warning of the book, the the length people go to to justify a lot of the stuff is a new thing. I really hate mm. about the book and the community, mm. like the community. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's just, and I'm looking forward to getting into. I'm starting to read some of the analyses, even though again they're trying way too hard. I was reading a whole thing on um, mother figures in Infinite Jest. And mm -hmm. more than three quarters of it is like, you know, Sigmund Freud's interpretation of mothers is like, oh, OK, you. <laughs> so pretty much you made you made a little diorama and then you're slapping an infinite jazz bumper sticker on the back. Mm. God. OK, that's how that. Yeah, works. there might be there might be stuff there that's interesting to dive into. I think it really depends on what you think the book is about. And maybe this is a good time before you get to the end of the book. I like I'd love to hear what you what is. Like, why did David Foster Wallace go to all this effort to put this giant book together? What was like, if he has it, what's like his core message? And and why would it be important to figure out like about mother figures or whatever? What do you think the core reason that he did all this work is? His core message is he he is very, very interested in the sins of the father and communication and drug addiction. And then there's another 800 pages that's just pure compulsion. That's mm. my, that is my that's honest, like, that, that's a little shitty, but at the same time, that is very much my, my thought. It's like, he almost like, I can, much like the people that are straining to explain a lot of the stuff, mm. I'm almost feeling a little bit of a, well, listen, I have this neat idea, but like, that's not, a, a, a good story isn't enough to impress everyone. Yeah. It's not enough for me to showcase all my, you know, gifts. Which, yeah. I, hey, you know what? Plenty of people seem to agree with him. So I can't, I can't say anything against that. Yeah, it is the sins of the father. And like, and that perhaps the book is too long. I mean, Dan Foster Wallace himself said that he had a problem with length, right? Like yeah. it was hard for him to like shorten things down. Um, and it does mean that there's a certain group of people that do manage to make it through the book, which changes what the community looks like because there are people that have a lot of free time and like are used to spending a lot of time with really huge books and universes and stuff so i i just think i don't know for me the what the book is about what it all what it all sort of is circling around in sort of the sort of annular fusion way that it is sort of like sort of like looking at this and looking at this and looking it's like circling around a core set of questions which is like the dysfunction that leads to our sort of um what leads to our addictions whether it is our mm -hmm. addictions to success or whether it is our addictions to particular drugs there's these things that lead us into this place that we we end up unable to break out of or communicate or connect with others okay and it has all these different inroads of like sometimes it's consumption of media like with the guy who gets addicted to mash sometimes it's consumption of drugs sometimes it's consumption of of like sexual success in the case of Oren. like all these things lead them into these places where they are getting what they want and there is still despair mm -hmm. 
and it still doesn't okay. work. And and there are all these angles for me that that is like approaching and investigating and trying to sort of like decouple us from those forces that lead us to those addictions. Mm -hmm. See, um, that is anyway. a that that is a generous, but I would not say altogether wrong interpretation of it. This is again this is another thing I'm actually coming to on very late into the book, mm -hmm. but I feel like because it's just so big. Again, a little bit like I just said ago with the Bible code. And also, like, if you look like a, a Nostradamus kind of point of view, there's so much in there that you really can make of it whatever you want. Like, you hit mm -hmm. the main core, but there is just enough of everything in here for anybody to get what they want out of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely large enough because the other tendency that we have as a culture is to, like, excerpt in small bits. Mm -hmm. And if you take a section of this out of it and look at it, you could make up whole sorts of things that the book is about. And I, I do think that if you try to hold it all in your head, you will notice like, oh, all of these are just like, like, I think there's a, a great amount of play in the book. Like there's a lot of things he just plays with, which are mm -hmm. just thrown away. There are things that are less deeply connected to those core principles. Um, but it's, yeah, I do think there is, I mean, this is a, a point of contention between me and culture at large. Culture at large loves to think that every one thing can be interpreted any mm -hmm. particular way you want to. I do think there is sort of a, a sailing direction of the book. And there's like a great amount of variation in terms of like what you think actually happens in the book and what you think the sort of core central claim is of it. Um, definitely, for sure. I just do think there there is there is enough there. I, that's why I still like the book. I mm -hmm. still like it. And I was actually so, I so as I think I, to, to sort of transition talking about the section, uh -huh. I had, I, when I came on the podcast with you last, I then closed the book and said, I need to take a break from this. And I loaned it to a friend. Like <laughs> mm -hmm. I gave it away. Cause each, if I have it around, I like start opening it and reading mm -hmm. through it and going at it and being like, what should I read instead? So I gave it away. And when you, you messaged me, I was like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta ask my friend to get the book back. And as I was walking over to get it from him, I'm like, Oh wait, that page range, it's that page range. And I felt all that excitement coming back. <laughs> like I have been, you have, you have drawn me back into my addiction, which is infinite Jess. Cause oh. this page range is incredible. Like this is, this is some good stuff. I don't know what your opinion on is it, but in my mind, uh, no, no, this uh, this was a very good section that I liked a lot. That I I only took a brief just because I remembered it last week where they talked about David Crone spider walking. Yeah, and <laughs> I cannot fathom. We can talk about it when we get to that. But another argument I've had this week is I don't understand people who say how funny this book is. Really? Oh, I I mean I cracked up at least twice in this section. Like yeah. I like there was there were things that made me laugh like quite a bit uh, I, um, I i am the first to admit i might be too stunted for this because i've said i've had a problem with like narrative humor before but mm -hmm. i i guess I'm, i am just so used to like set up punch that it's i don't know I yeah don't yeah know. yeah no it's definitely a different kind of comedy i think what makes me laugh about it is usually like some dimension of pacing or like a particular phrase that is just outrageous like there's a there is an outrageousness that makes me like cackle mm -hmm. at it and it's not funny in the way that like i feel good at the end of it because i don't feel good usually after sections of it like i feel pretty like oh that's awful that's really bad but mm -hmm. the way it is described often makes me giggle. like I'm the, the one thing that's coming to mind is when in this particular section Gately goes like he, he wakes up again and his arm is no longer numb and he became immediately nostalgic for the time that it was cement <laughs> okay. numb like I like I laugh at that because of the the particular way it's phrased I guess and I I have when I read this book I tend to cackle a lot aloud mm -hmm. so but I I do think it's because I've read it many times and it's starting to become like an old friend for me and maybe that's mm -hmm. part of it so maybe okay. maybe on the first pass it's just too overwhelming it's just too much information. It might be. be. It, it really might be. And especially, you got to keep in mind, I'm reading this in a different way than probably anybody else has in that I'm sure. typing up a summary as I go. <laughs> yeah, you you decided to do a podcast and, and on that podcast, you'd read Infinite Jest. You didn't start reading Infinite Jest and decide to do a podcast about it, right? Like exactly. That's the, that's the sequence, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a different approach, which is, it's very interesting. So, yeah. hmm. But I, I am- I it's I, fine. I, Oh, yeah. Now, I am liking now that we're getting into the end where like because I have had chunks before where I have had like in an episode, I have had nine different scenes to deal with where in this we're pretty much dealing with like one, one and a half, maybe. Well, and that gets to the core of how the section works, which is so interesting. And and I, I think this is one of those and it's one of the most the least rather interrupted sections of the book. Right. The footnotes are really minimal. Right. Exactly. Like see, is, we almost we almost always on this show do like 30 page chunks. But there was just 
there was no way to break this up where it was either going to be a little too long or a little too short. So I went with the too long when I saw that it mostly followed on Gately in a hospital bed. Great choice. This is this is an excellent. Yeah, I'm really glad you didn't break up this section because mm-hmm. for me, this is one of the most uh, masterful sections of writing in mm-hmm. that David Foster Wallace attaches himself to Gately's perspective and only mm-hmm. what Gately has present memory of and his what he's experiencing, mm-hmm. which gives him. I mean, he's got like fragments of memories that other people that Gately, like Gately has lived through things, but he doesn't remember it. And people are telling him about it, mm-hmm. like what happened after he passed out the first time. He's got dreams that are like wild, outrageous experiences that we're getting to like go through as Gately experiences them. And then uh, like stories from other people, like this first thing from uh, from Ewell. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's even though it is all just chained to the hospital bed that Gately's in, there's incredible variety in terms of what we experience as readers. Yeah, but it's all. It feels I was going to say it feels very grounded. Yes. For everything. I Just agree. because we have, uh, unlike a lot of this book, uh, Wallace pretty much dropped an anchor and like, we're going to look around from this perspective, but we're not moving from this spot for a while. Yeah. No, it's, it, it really gets into the depth of like the incredible, like how frightening Gately's position is mm-hmm. because he can't speak. He, and you know, this, this rep- repeated image of he, like of a silent scream, mm-hmm. right? That he can't, he can't manage to express anything is trying to communicate in all these different ways and not being heard mm-hmm. is, is then counterbalanced with the hilarity of like Ewell's story of grifting on a grift and mm-hmm. how badly that went on him. And then also against like the image of people like going like, we don't know how to put a tourniquet on the shoulder and like Joel Van Dyne <laughs> sitting on Gately's bleed, you know, bleeding body. Like mm-hmm. there's this like incredible variety of stuff. And, but it's all grounded as like Gately is desperately trying to figure out like, am I going to live? And did I kill anyone? And, yeah. You know, did, like, did I kill anyone? Will I live? If I live, am I going to prison? Like what's happening? Yes. And he's just trying to get breath by breath through it. And exactly. we with get all these wonderful, colorful experiences. So it's one of the best sections of the book for me. It's also one of the ones that I have always, I always have dog eared because it's the, mm-hmm. the book takes a crazy turn uh, when the Wraith shows up. Like, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I remember when uh, when the Antitwa brother was killed, and suddenly we had his spirit screaming northward into Canada. I noted at the time, like, where the fuck did that come from? Because that was the first yeah. anything spiritual. And somehow, um, somehow, in all the spoilers about this book, the entire wraith spiritual aspect of it really, uh, I knew nothing of it up until a few weeks ago. But then again, it is. It doesn't happen until eight hundred pages into the book. With only yes and, one yes hint. and no. Well, there's there's one uh, other hint. There's one okay. other there's one other sort of thing hinted at about it. Or maybe uh, yeah, that that Lyle is a wraith, uh, as that guy told us, <sighs> as he informed us so clearly. I I would say wrote the final word beyond <laughs> argument. <laughs> he's a he's a genius critic. He's well respected in at least one circle of people. So I, I just uh, anyway, the, the, I don't the I don't, wizard the wizard of the infinite jest how posting Facebook group indeed. Yeah, he came in out of nowhere from Twitter and told us the absolute truth and then disappeared in a not puff since, of smoke. Not since Tesla has somebody changed the game so much. <laughs> Let's start going through it a bit Definitely. like section by section and um all right. and just talk about all the different things that happen here because like again it is like it's also very hard. I wonder how you've broken it up in sections. Cause it's sort of, it's sort of just all gately in the chair and then different people yeah. talking to him. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I do things the way I typically do. I just read through and I try to keep anything that seems important. Uh, yeah. A lot of notes. Uh, I, God, I only just started writing this on Microsoft word. So now I have a word counter at the bottom and I realize just how long these fucking things are. I'm writing every week. Text edit on Mac is nice enough to not inform me how much of my life I'm wasting on this book. You can get into practice writing. Before you know it, you'll be writing a book everyone can love to hate or hate. I am writing a pro wrestling column every Wednesday night. And that's, I mean, I think I'm changing the world in my own way (laughs) via backflips and spandex. Yeah, backflips and spandex. You got to start, what you have to start doing is start encouraging the pro wrestlers to also read Infinite Jest and listen to your podcast. And then you could have like, it's Madam Psychosis in the ring. Here she comes, (laughs) right? Like, I don't know. (laughs) That that is what I'm going for. I I realize that what I am going for here a little bit, uh, uh, some praise I got on Twitter this week was Mm. uh, somebody saying, I love this podcast because it combines two things I love, people from the Jersey Shore and dunking (laughs) on pretentiousness. 
which I, I realize that's what I'm doing is I am I am interpreting high art in a very lowbrow way. And then on the wrestling thing, I am interpreting lowbrow art in a very mm-hmm. highbrow way. Because, dude, I am I am slipping in infinite jest references every week into that fucking wrestling article. That's amazing. I'm so glad you're doing that. And I just want a quick note for all, all the people who feel like infinite jest shouldn't be interpreted in that lowbrow way. Dave Foster Wallace loved to do that. He went, he wrote a column about the Iowa state, uh, Illinois state fair rather, Mm -hmm. and wrote uh, an incredible essay about going on a cruise, like as like, as just a sort of like bodily experience. right? Right. Like he was interested in this sort of like way that like, you could look at a sport like tennis and make, Make it, you know, as he would say, chess on the run, like the, mm-hmm. and like how you could soliloquize and highly interpret very simple, basic things. So you're you're right on. You're in the right vein to be writing those things about uh, writing columns about pro wrestling. So just keep on swimming down that track. Good all choice. Right. Well, I appreciate it because with all the hate, I need all the encouragement I can get these days. I'm all always right. down to encourage you. Let's let's get into the section. All right. 809 to 827 is our first section, just to okay. show you how big this is. Yeah. Beatley is lying in a hospital bed, in and out of consciousness since the parking lot fracas. The mm-hmm. feeling appears to be breathing. That's going to be an illusion that pops in and out. Yeah. Um, he remembers a shore house his mother rented when he was a child that they got cheap because there was a hole in the ceiling covered in plastic <laughs> that breathed in the same fashion. Ghostish. So fig- crazy. Oh yeah. Like it's just who would, who would rent that house, but this is gay. Oh, it's, it's so good. It's so oh, I to- my dad totally would have been the guy like got a deal on the place. Just pray it don't rain. No, not for the beach for the house. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, wow. Well, well. We'll, we'll so have an, um, we'll have an umbrella at the dining room table. Uh, Ghostish, fig- ghostish figures appear and disappear in his peripheral vision. He keeps having a dream of robbing an Oriental man's house and blindfolding him with twine, just like that joke everybody's racist uncle has. Yeah. Uh, what's the what's the joke the racist uncle has? Oh, that's what he says. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, uh, well, no, 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 no. That's actually what I said. But uh, it's it, it, you never heard of the old one like, oh, yeah, those Asians, you can blindfold them with dental floss because their oh, eyes are so thin. Oh, no, I, I honestly didn't. I didn't get that that's the joke that's that he's like playing with in that dream. So mm. thank you. I didn't. That somehow totally missed me. I've never heard that joke. Huh. Uh, um, okay. Wild. <laughs> He comes into consciousness as tiny. I've been pronouncing it Ewell. How did you pronounce oh, it? Oh, I've been saying Ewell, but maybe Ewell makes more sense. Yeah, maybe. I mean, either one. Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea. I've never, I've never, like, to give you an indication of, like, how often I've spoken to people about this book, I don't think mm. I've actually ever said his name out loud because uh, I haven't gotten that deep into, like, breaking the book down. So let's say Ewell. We'll say Ewell, as you have said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, I've been wrong on things. I had was talking with somebody, uh, the difference between Marath and Marat a few weeks ago, which it seems Marat is the more accurate one. Oh, is that like the Quebecois way to say it? Marat? Yeah, which okay. you, you figure French, it would have that longer A, Marie, but eh, whatever. Um, Quebec. He comes into rules. consciousness as Tiny Ewell visits him and tells him how he became the leader of a group of tough kids in the third grade, the Money Stealers Club. They do fake door-to-door donations for a non-existent hockey team. Ewell was quite silver-tongued, and yeah, he then began hiding the money and from the club and spending it, getting off on fooling everybody. So we have a little bit of, of how uh beaching up there yeah. where it's not even it's not even that it's the fun of getting away with it which as somebody who was a very talented teenage shoplifter i understand that thrill absolutely like the the pleasure of having something other people don't know right because mm-hmm. he succeeds in becoming the oh dogs are barking sorry he, be, he succeeds in becoming the leader of this ring right but that success itself is not enough he needs some other fix and so now it's that he's stealing from them right and yeah, it's it's so interesting that we get sort of we get that this sort of parallel version of like Hal and Tiny Ewell, but you will both very smart kids and how that so their brains sort of like run away with their ability to do stuff. Right? Like they are they no, nobody can stop them because they're smart enough to like dodge under everybody's radar. Yeah. Yeah. If they hadn't become drug addicts, they would have started a Ponzi scheme, maybe. Probably. I mean, this was this is a this is a perfect Ponzi scheme. Exactly. So uh, he got all this money collected, but then Christmas came okay, and he started s- stealing from the tin himself. But then Christmas came and the money stealers club, they all wanted to make a withdrawal f- of donations that have already been spent. So Tiny started staying home, suggesting private school while his gangmates <laughs> would ring his bell every day and ask Mrs. Ewell to send him out to play. 
<laughs> How frightening. Oh, it's so good. It's like, oh, yeah. cause yeah, he's just, he's hiding from them. And the, the section I have pulled out from that is, well, actually it's a, it's a little bit next. He eventually steals from his father's right. uh, like uh, electrical workers union. Is that what it was? The yeah. IBEW. Yeah. And like steals like a hundred dollars in petty cash to pay them back, mm-hmm. does pay them back, but they get beat up. And the section I just wanted to say out loud because I liked it. I discovered the latent rage in followers, the fate of the leader who falls from the mob's esteem. And I just wrote next to it, 45, because like, because <laughs> what's happening right now is like the 45th president is walking the tightrope mm-hmm. of trying to make sure he doesn't fall from the esteem of the mob he's created. Right. Like, and Dude, he, like, anyway, it, yeah. no, I understand. It is so fucking crazy to watch. Like, yeah. To watch this play out in real life because uh it, it was funny when his niece wrote that book she wrote that like he always got by on like he just promised people the moon and then when he couldn't deliver they were so entranced they had to double down or admit they'd been fucking hoodwinked and now when you're seeing that the only thing i can say is in my little philadelphia neighborhood that gives me any hope whatsoever most of the trump flags have come down yeah. yeah, it's happened in my neighborhood as well because I'm out in the suburbs. So there were uh, there were a few that were like they would hide them behind cars that they'd park because we're mm-hmm. not like a super right leaning neighborhood, but they've mm-hmm. also come down. So there is some sort of transition happening. And I do wonder, I just think what what we're seeing right now is Donald Trump trying to avoid this latent rage. Right. He yeah. is he is trying to keep the mesmer going so that they don't turn on him. Well, especially and, like not even like just to try and hold on to power, but the simple fact that like he's going to get out of this uh, presidency and then he still has all these lawsuits looking for him. Moreover, he's in debt. He needs these fucking rubes to sell whatever his shit is coming next because yeah. he has nothing else. He can't, he cannot afford to have the mob turn against him, even though it would be an epic Shakespearean tragedy <laughs> if he just held a Trump rally and they just devoured him like wild dogs. That that sounds, yeah, that would be like, that's even deeper. That's like the Greek tragedy. That's like the the end of, uh, uh, what's the one with the Bach? It's just called the Bach guy, I think. Yeah, the Bach guy. Or the one where the, no the, the followers of Dionysus okay. rip the leader to shreds after mm-hmm. he comes out to like try and engage in the revels. Like, anyway, it's, it's very brutal. It's very dark. But yeah, it would be real Greek tragedy if like, if they just did properly stop, like whether they tore him to shreds or just really turned on him. So anyway, I just thought it was an interesting connection to see yeah this like this there's this problem where you grift and then you have to like either admit the failure Mm -hmm. um and even ewell here doesn't even admit it to them right they just they just oh yeah turn on him because they they made him wait basically yeah he loses control of his narrative of power over them and Mm -hmm. there is this response that destroys him so anyway i just wanted to mention it because i was like that's too real Hey, you know what? I, I think I, I think the microcosm that everybody can relate to in some way or another of something like that, because not everybody gets grifted by a leader at some point. Right. But I feel like everybody has had the bad breakup where like the thing you saw about somebody and then in an instant you're like, I can't believe I ever fucking fell for somebody who would do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or the reverse where you it, you say to someone like uh, this just isn't working for this reason or whatever. And then this lens cracks where they like, I don't know, they're like, wait, but was it this or was it this? And like all of a sudden, also this person who liked you falls out of favor hard with you Mm -hmm. and really hates you. Like, because anyway, so like, but I feel like people have either been on one of those sides or probably been on both in their life. Yeah, that's it's it's healthy. You should you should break a heart and have your heart broken. What the fuck was that? Uh, Something I said woke up Siri who lives in my wrist. (laughs) Sorry about that. I am surrounded by technology that I do not understand. (laughs) That's okay. Okay. Um, So, yeah. Going on. You will vow to change and never committed another felony knowingly again until the parking lot fracas. Then one. You will also the one who has long blackouts. Is that you will or is that another one? Oh, I actually have no idea. I they get the the characters in the house get a little confused to me because their names are kind of similar because it's Ool and Arity. No, Arity is the drug. Arity. Erdity is the the marijuana guy. So I think yes. Tiny Ewill is the one who drinks and has had like long blackouts. So that that okay. never committed no, another felony felony knowingly is not a big claim because he has lots of his life he doesn't remember. Right. Okay. That, that's funny. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. 
Um, oh, he says after the parking lot fracas, one night he dreamed the entire entire ordeal again and woke up with his goatee shaved, his hair parted in the same way he did in childhood, and with an anti-acne bar of soap with a chunk bitten out of it in his hand. So even in sobriety, he's still uh, he's having some struggles there. It would seem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It does seem that, he- and like I think the other thing that it's pointing out is this: this is like a very formative experience for him that has informed the rest of his addictions, and that comes up several times. Um, that what you can't do is you can't manage to forget what you would not want to remember. I think it's maybe said in reverse: you you can't not remember what you'd like to forget. Right. And Gately is also going through that, like with no ability to be distracted because he's either got pain or nothing. So he has to like deal with what he's remembering or deal with mm-hmm. the pain. And, and it's, so mentioned, being... it's mentioned in the chapter and a few other places that one of the horrible things of sobriety is you really you will get these random vivid memory bubbles that you, yeah. you can't help but remember. Yeah, because the thing you were using to stop you from remembering is not there anymore. Like mm-hmm. it was always there and you were doing something to distract yourself from it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, burrs. Okay, uh, going on. What do you got next? Okay. Uh, despite Gately's pain, he wants to tell Yule he totally IDs. And if he just keeps working the program, everything will work out. All right, I'm full of shit. I forget because a lot of, I'm looking at my notes. I'm like, all right, that was pretty fucking funny. It's so funny. It's also, it's hilarious. And I think it's the little thing that DFW was saying is like Gately's redeeming quality is that Gately is able to do this identification, even though his right shoulder is on fire. Mm-hmm. Right. And and this is something that Hal, with his perfect life, can often not do or that uh, um, Hal's father could not do. Like Hal's father could knew how to suffer and be unhappy. But to identify with somebody else mm-hmm. who is suffering is not necessarily his perfect is what their quality really has. Or they're trying to get it. And if they, they sometimes get it, they sometimes don't. But Gailey always does this. Mm-hmm. So, you what- know, I, I actually read that a little different. Not, not that I think you're wrong. I think it's just a little different interpretation. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. I just read it as a. Uh, like if there's anything addicts are used to, it's routine. They're used to the yeah. routine of getting high. And then when they get sober, they get used to the routine of like AA and something like that. I so, see. I see so, I, okay. so I read this here as he just doesn't know how to respond to the guy or even what to the, he mentions a few times that like, now that I can't talk, I'm quite the fucking popular conversationalist. It seems, but I almost read it as just his usual, like, yeah, I, I do with that, buddy. Just keep working at the because he doesn't he can't say anything else. You're right. That is a that there is definitely a claim to say that that would be like the that he's just sort of responding by rote. Mm-hmm. There is something also in this section that makes me think it's a little different than that. But I, I still I don't think you're necessarily wrong. Well, I, 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 I do think it's definitely a little bit of both because we have yeah. seen Gately genuinely ID with people, especially the end of this where he really wants uh ferocious francis g to come by somebody he ids with immensely and obviously hal's entire problem is he can't get outside of himself at all like he barely knows what he himself is thinking let alone gives a shit what anybody else is feeling or or the other the other thing that's interesting about hal is it's almost a flip side hal is so good at understanding not how people are feeling, but what they want that he can mm-hmm. like perfectly perform it for them. Mm-hmm. But that does not mean that he is like understood at his deeper self. And you know what? That's actually something. Now that you mentioned that, that's something that's definitely a callback of Oren, who Oren flat yes. saying like, "Tell me who you want me to be, and I will be that." Mm-hmm. That Hal, exactly. even though he kind of looks down on Oren for doing that, is doing the same performance just for different audiences constantly, right? And we get a bit of if insight. That fucking in- subreddit. Listen to this section right here. They would be so in they just can't get over themselves <laughs> I, again it's that well hold on I, let's before we get back on the subreddit let's finish talking about the section and then we can talk about how i'd love to reform the david foster wallace fandom but anyway okay. anyway i don't know it's just mm. it's, they just don't seem to come with enough love or identification like yeah. they don't seem to identify with people who are not already experts in the book and it's like the whole book is about identification the whole thing is at its core about like trying to understand people who mm-hmm. are in a mess, like people who are struggling and you are looking at someone who is like struggling their way through a thing or like is at least genuinely trying mm-hmm. and you're trashing them. It's like, how did you, how can you claim to love this book? And at the same time, trash someone who, anyway, I, I, they are <laughs> incongruous positions in my mind. I, I agree. But, 
So, all right, we can get back into it. Uh, yeah, let's get back into it. Little detail here. Uh, it, it's hinted that Gately's infection, which seems to be more his trouble right now than the actual gunshot, might have been from something unsanitized used to treat the wound before he was brought to the hospital, which, again, is something I think fits in the greater theme of the book of, like, just trying to help, and that turned out to be one of the Bad. worst things that happened. Yeah. Well, it's also how long it took him to get, like, because they so. just they didn't put him in an ambulance right away. Like, so mm -hmm. no matter, like he was taken into the house, which is known to be not like the most sanitary of places. And he was being mm -hmm. propped up on the couch with a, a locker, I think, right? To like stop him from right. falling off of it. Like all number of like things that it's just like, you know what? I bet you somebody, like they probably don't wipe it down with bleach because it's a halfway house, right? Yeah. Exactly. So, but it, it, the real problem is that they took so long. <laughs> Like yeah. a long time to get him to a, into an ambulance. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's all, it's a very interesting detail that it's like not the gunshot wound. It's like now this other thing that he's dealing yeah. with. Like, it seems like the gunshot yeah. wound fucked him up, but it's, it's the infection that, and that also makes sense to just as a writer that like, that's where you're going to get into more of the dreamy in between like constant feverishness as somebody yeah. who's been reading a lot of Dostoevsky the last six months a fever and an infection can make an entire fucking book out of several books in fact yeah I, I also it definitely provides really fertile ground for the writer stuff but it's also a really like straightforward plot progression like mm -hmm. I think after that sort of gunshot unless you immediately sanitize it it was probably going to get infected like I mean yeah. like it really makes perfect sense. It reads perfectly, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of like, oh yeah, that would be the problem. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Uh, Gately passes out and dreams. Dreams of his mother being beaten while he's in his crib. We're going to get a yeah. lot of that. There's a, escaping outside to see a tornado chase him as he runs down the beach. He runs into the water and hides underneath. It is not clear whether he is little Bimmy or grown man Don in this dream. Yeah, his what do you make of that? What did you make of that dream? Um... I, 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 I found it pretty interesting. I think that's actually a great detail that happens in a lot of dreams that yeah. you're not really aware of. Like everybody, they've had a little like, am I in a dream right now? But I think just as common is the, I have had dreams where I am back in middle school. And yet when I think of myself in that dream, I have like the full beard that I have. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Like you're, you're on. Cause, cause in this interesting way, we, and I think this ties back to what was happening with Ewell, where he was saying, like this m moment in his past still motivates him today. And he like dressed himself up as his young self. Mm -hmm. Like we are carrying these past traumas or these past issues with us. Mm -hmm. And they are, st and just a, a certain thing can shove us right into being that person again. Yeah, no, our, our consciousness is essentially in super position in that yeah. you are still, you're still the eight year old boy who's, you know, mommy neglected him. You're still the 14 year old that the girls didn't like, but yeah. while also being your present day self, it's all, everything is informing itself at all times. Yeah. And the dream itself with the sort of like tornado sucking the mother up and like uh -huh. him having to avoid it reminded me a lot of the sergeant at arms where everyone's kneeling. And then if someone stands, they get sort of sucked up by at that point, it was a crook, but I also, and there was an image where the his mom was being beaten with a shepherd's crook, I think. Mm -hmm. So like, it all seemed to me that he was like, it, he was seeing his mother be lost to that thing right. that he was also trying to avoid dying from. Mm. And yeah. I, I, I do see, I, I also really like the imagery here where he has that she's sucked up into the vortex. And as he is watching his mother spinning, being sucked up, the breathing ceiling reappears behind her. Mm -hmm. So literally the fading back into consciousness, bleeding yeah. over into each other. It's so filmic, right? Like I would like it's so, it's so it's this so, scene it's in particular image. would be very good on film. I had that thought yeah. while reading this. Yeah, yeah, and that's just a quality of a lot of the great sections of this book is that it's like this would be so cool to like actually film. Mm -hmm. It would look so cool in a film. It's, I still wonder why like no DFW fans if if they'd taken a break from criticizing me and just started <laughs> filming shit. <laughs> I'm I'm joking with that obviously, but I, have, uh, but I, yeah, I am surprised it. more people haven't filmed some of the stuff from this. I think it's just so perfectly like it's it's a, honestly at its heart it's such a it's such a a perfect example of what a novel can do and other genres can't mm -hmm. that tackling it is like really difficult because there is at least one other piece of work that has been turned into a film by Dave Foster Wallace. It's, uh, brief interviews with hideous men they did make some sort of relatively unsuccessful film out of, but oh. uh, I just think this book in particular with the way that it the way it utilizes perspective the way it interrupts narrative is mm -hmm. so is such a like 
uh, an excellent example of a novel at its highest form mm -hmm. that translating that into a film risks losing a lot. And, and so I think people have avoided it. I thought of doing it as a theater piece because I think it could be really fun to like be pulled from different perspectives and maybe just have different things happening simultaneously that you can go and observe and there's reference to other things. But again, it becomes a, it's not really like an adaption. It is a right. translation. Like honestly, the only way I could see this being adapted to film it, it outside of like the multimedia like multiple screens at the same time i would almost think you would need to give it to like five or six different filmmakers mm. and have them all exist in their own like mm. timeline more or less yeah, that's interesting each with their that's own style I don't know. um let's, so let's we, got, we keep getting off subject <laughs> that's fine we're talkers we got the we got the gift of gab that's fine well i hope i i hope it's a gift for me and not a curse you definitely have the gift i don't know what i have okay. now you have you have the gift of as somebody with the gift of gab you have the gift of gab <laughs> thank you so much for the gift of gab <laughs> continue on great gabber uh pat montesian visits and let's let's don know that if he knows in his heart of hearts that painkillers would not be satisfying his inner addict he should not consider his sobriety broken i don't talk on that too much just because it's in the background of a lot of this but he's struggling yeah. with a lot of this with like i don't want the painkillers because he's an addict yeah he's on so much tylenol his ears are ringing but mm -hmm. like he's refusing to take painkillers because he yeah he, he has made it very clear that he can't have it because he thinks it'll get addicted again like it's so clear how afraid of that he is yeah he is willing to i mean what he's feeling is so intense and he has not caved and there are several times i, I don't think it's in this section where he very much says like no don't as much as he can even though he's in incredible pain so he's very scared of Demerol. So I've actually heard uh, there is a a radio personality named Ron Bennington who has mm -hmm. talked before from the show Ron and Fez. If you guys haven't heard it, go check it out. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, he has a history of addiction. And I remember a video clip I saw once where he, as a middle-aged man, had to get surgery. And he had to tell the nurse, like, I don't want anything, any kind of painkiller. And they really leaned on him like, no, you really should. And then he finally like, all right, you know what? I'll do that. And then in that moment, instantly, he was like, all right, well, I'm going to be on morphine. And he started, he went on to Spotify on his phone and started putting together like his old junkie playlist from back in the day. And then wow. as soon as he was aware of it, he like, it, like it freaked the shit out of me that like so quickly I was ready to just slide back into that groove yeah. that it scared the shit out of me. And I, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's scary. And it's, I don't know. I think it's a really interesting um, dilemma because, mm -hmm. and so as a character and what's therefore delicious as an audience is to get to see this character, try to figure out how, what is the right thing for me to do? Cause all of these things look kind of bad, right? right? Like, so, and it's, I, I, I think that's why it's so rich and so interesting to get to develop, even though we, I don't know that we get a ton of the emotional reality of that for Gately. Well, see, part of it is we're, we're also, we're, we're getting like the emotional struggle of somebody who's not really all there right now too. Yeah. Yeah. He's in and out and in and out. He's barely mm. able to like, yeah. But he seems to have like, even though he's like barely there, he clings to like absolutely no, what is it? Schedule four or schedule four or above or schedule three. And like, he's like, absolutely none of that and that he holds on to that so deeply i think reveals how how deeply he has let the program influence his core personality how much he has changed right like because mm. we're talking about somebody who has was an addict and he's working really hard to work against those impulses in himself right so uh, it's ha has said repeatedly what a miracle it was when he just realized i've gone a few days without thinking about getting high how yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so we have the little detail here that at the end of their meeting, Pat burst into tears and Gately was so awkward and embarrassed. He pretended to fall asleep and then did fall asleep and then did fall asleep. <laughs> That's always great when that happens. Uh, Isn't that nice? Yeah. Uh, Joel uh, visited him, but said nothing. His whole upper right quadrant felt swollen and ready to burst. And he wanted to cry like a small child. Mm. Now we get to the meat and potatoes. When Calvin thrust shows up, I do not recall Calvin thrust at any point in this book oh he he has been mentioned because he's been mentioned as like a previous porn star and it was like in but it was he's very that, early okay, on okay i yeah. remember i remember that detail i just didn't remember the name with it yeah well calvin perfect Thrust. name calvin i mean it's, it's it's one of those things every oh, time hey, i see it i'm just like when i work. when i worked as a blogger for a porn company we all had to pick our own pseudonyms and i was victor vaselino wow <laughs> <laughs> which was my, my uncle Rick's recommendation. He said when he found that I had that job, like I always said, if I ever got into porn, my name would be Victor Vaselino. So that's what I took. I'm sorry. I'm just 
<laughs> I just have to enjoy that for a minute. Oh, that's so good. I, think okay. I, was, I, I was doing the same highbrow, lowbrow thing at that site too, because I would do like these deep, uh, <laughs> these deep dives into like specific fetishes. Dude, my favorite one, uh, I did a whole article on like, strong woman muscle fetishes like mm. like when you mm. see them like they're picking the guy up and like squeezing their heads i interviewed a bunch of people who were into that fetish you know what they all had in common what they all had older sisters who would beat them up when they were little oh oh that's just that's so oh man that's Mwah. the human condition <laughs> <laughs> this is why i hope there's reincarnation because I don't I, I want to ride all the rides. I don't I don't <laughs> yeah, just want to be straight vanilla white guy. I want to come you wanna, back. <laughs> you want to pick the other origin stories. You want to do the video game over exactly. and over and over again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, the nice thing about being human is that we can like really thoroughly identify with and seek out these narratives and try to experience them just by proxy. I do anyway, with that. I do with that a lot. <laughs> That's how I try. That's my version of trying to ride all the rides is just trying to like understand as many people as possible. But all right, there's, so, there's a lot to be said of how the limits of that. So, yeah. okay. Let's so let's, let's keep our heads down for a minute and just try to get through all the details that thrust gives us. Although I will, just cause I am being critical. I will pop in that we do get another end, but so from a completely unrelated character to remind everyone that DFW sometimes just can't help himself. I love the and but so I do. I use it all the time now. <laughs> okay. So here is the gist. Um, after Gately passed out from the gunshot, mm-hmm. they'd gotten the secure they'd gotten to the security card before he could call the cops and pulled him inside. Yeah. That despite laying their shot, Len started bitching about how he was somehow gonna get blamed for all this. And that Bruce Green like gripped him up and slapped him around a bit, but didn't gr- rat out Green uh, didn't rat him out and still hasn't even though he knows he's the only one who knows what started the whole thing. Cause he saw him killing the next dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Bruce, is, t- Bruce is really tough yeah. <laughs> in that way. I'm, I'm liking Bruce green more and more. I hope we get a little more time with him before the book's done. Uh, I don't like that face. Okay. 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 <laughs> no spoilers. I'm trying to remember, but I, uh, okay, let's go on. All right. Thrust had used all his professional willpower to drag Lens into the next room and demand he either leave of his own will or submit to a neuro test now with a que- along with a questioning from the cops, which we're going to see in a second might not have been like everybody just wants Lens fucking gone because they want to kill him. But unfortunately, immediately everyone's like, wait, we need Lens here. <laughs> like yeah. He is very critical to the story <laughs> here to the police. Yeah, that that moment, uh, I think, where because uh, also I just want to quick mention because mm-hmm. you're as you're running it down, we're getting this, this story like Thrust is telling Gately, here's what happened right after mm-hmm. you left, which is such a delicious way to get it in bits and pieces. Right. We've been wondering for so long what happened after Gately was shot and we're getting it now in little bits and pieces uh, mm-hmm. as the evening unrolls. And so we're getting like an incomplete picture of it that also Gately is unable to be like, wait, you let him go. <laughs> and then yeah. he hears that Joel Van Dyne was upset that Lentz was let go as well. And Gately's trying to agree emphatically mm. as much as he can <laughs> in his immobilized position that Joel Joel is right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, All right, going so- on. Everyone was unsure what to do, knowing Gately was on probation and the violence had been so visceral, it was hard to tell who did what to who in self-defense. Pat Montesian showed up and yelled at everybody for not just taking Gately to the hospital themselves. Uh, Pat, <laughs> the Pat, drove Ga- Pat drove Gately herself with Joel riding shotgun, leaving the house attendants to deal with the Boston PD. Mm-hmm. Every man who helped move Gately now think they have hernias because of his massive heft. <laughs> How much do you fucking weigh? <laughs> exactly. That's the that's another moment that I had to yeah. laugh. Uh, yeah. Gately lays there curious but unable to speak. He wants to ask if anybody died, if the DA came snooping around, and what the fuck was he thinking of cutting Lens loose and possibly leave him holding the bag for all this? But his blinks go unnoticed. <laughs> Um, Joel gave him shit for letting Lens go too. Thrust defends himself that everybody, including himself, was ready to demap the fucking guy and wanted him gone for that. Lens's car was found and towed not far from Ennett the next day, full to the brim of his personal belongings. This just gives me the hope that he meets a poor end. We know we know Remy's out there rolling around looking for volunteers. So yeah, 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 yeah. Keep rubbing those hands together. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. The house manager did her duty to protect all the residents with remaining legal issues and physically spread her arms and legs blocking and its door, informing all police and security that all the people inside were protected by court mandate of the state of Massachusetts and could only be entered under a court order. Pat M is considering promoting her for her quick thinking. Is that is that Johnette? Because I don't. Uh, they just said the Jeanette? house manager. I feel like it's definitely somebody we've met. I just don't remember the name right now. You know, it's escaping me as well, but it, it will come up. Okay. It, it will come up again, and I always have to keep my eyes on it. It might be Jeanette. Mm. It might be. That sounds right to me. But to be honest, names are one of the harder things to keep track of in this. Yeah, there's a lot. You're you, you're gonna have different notes than me coming up here because they gave a lot of random notes on what's happened to everybody since, and I didn't I didn't keep a lot of them. Yeah, it was so much. Again, there's a there's also a part of me that sort of has a limit on what I think is like important to track. Right. Right. There, because there are the core characters, it's worth tracking to make sense of the overall plot. But then at a certain point, it's like these are all like pieces of color that are helping you understand. Right. Like if you really want like the absolute outside edge of understanding what's going on, but the to me the core narrative is contained in mm-hmm. like, and there's a danger because you might cut out something that helps you make sense of the story. But right. Well, we have that uh, on my next note right here. Uh, one resident Thrail had run off screaming during the fracas of that night and never returned. Her car towed along with Lens. So, like, I don't know if that's going to pop up yeah. in a second. I mean, it sounds like it. It sounds like it sounds like it's just waiting to return in some sort of exactly. Way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thrust mentions offhand that Cleve and Gompert got mugged, but only Cleve ever returned. Yep. So Kate is out wandering the Boston wherever. Well, the is. last we saw her, she was drinking with Marat. Right. Right, and, Marat right, right. But, made her... and she was talking about having been hit in the head, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 She 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 had gotten mugged, bashed her by poor Tony, bashed her face on a pole, and immediately said, fuck this, I'm having a drink. Yeah. And I think the sort of like really stupid implication there is that she feels great after having her head hit like electrical shock therapy never worked. All she Mm. needed was a hard strike to the forehead and she doesn't (laughs) feel depressed anymore. Or at least it's a short term reaction to the pain or whatever. But it's kind of a weird it's it's not it's one of my excuse me. It's one of my least favorite little moves that the book does, because I'm Mm. like, wait, she had like some of the most beautiful, expressive statements about how depression works. Mm. And she's just going to get hit in the head and not be sad anymore. Like that's that. I don't like that. I don't like that very much. It's hey, it's a it's a hit in the head and also some Kahlua. That's all you need sometimes. Maybe it was that the drinking was making her feel better. But anyway, I I, it was one of those uh, that particular moment. I know that's not in this section was one that I was like, hmm. Oh, yeah. Like <laughs> um, all right. We get a bunch of details on Ennit residents, and that's where we finally get the story of David Crone, who popped up last week when Hal came in to uh, Ennit to see about a meeting and mm-hmm. saw a man spider walking around, hitting his head on the doors. And uh, so let's take a look here and see what differentiates this from Too Stupid for a Kids cartoon show to <laughs> postmodern literature classic. Crone was an upscale junior executive with a wife and kids, and he got drunk at an office party and took the mm-hmm. limbo challenge to extreme extremes and messed up his spine and is now stuck in permanent limbo mode now. I agree that it is it is just absurd. Like it is the weirdest of things to mm. To like the other thing that's kind of odd is that it specifically mentions that he works on the fans, the giant displacement fans mm. that are at the oh. edge of Boston, right? Okay. It, it, I missed that. that. I missed that. There's detail. that big acronym. I'm looking for it right now. A T H, like Acme, but with oh the a- words in the middle. And the yeah, the Acme air displacement. Like he was, so he was some sort of junior executive guy working for that, right? Mm-hmm. That and they're the fans that are mounted just north of. Yeah of Ennett blowing uh, toxic fumes away. Right. So it's uh, like that ties that in to what we know, like we've gotten several times mention of those fans and their significance. But other than that, it's very hard to justify like why this happens. I, but, I, I, yeah. I think that, I think that is part of my issue with absurdism in narrative fiction, just because just because it's words on a page. I feel like it's just so unearned because it doesn't it doesn't need to be explained it's not like it needs to be shot interestingly it just needs to be said i don't know something something about that just rubbed me so fucking wrong just just because it's so like uh hal stepping outside of his comfort zone and there's a guy being all what to do in the corner oh is that my macarthur fellowship thank you i earned this 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's pretty weird. I don't I don't know what to tell you except that it is I mean the 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 whole thing that is really important about Edit House is that it is supposed to be like up on the hill is these these perfect kids with perfect lives. Mm. Still really screwed up because their parents will sometimes not even slow down as they kick them out of the door as they right. and they have to like pick gravel out of their knees. But down the hill is like this real version of people who are totally broken, who are doing this work to to fix themselves. And so they are supposed to be scary and they're supposed to be people that don't look perfect. And yeah. this is just like a great example of somebody who has made a horrific mistake and is trying to fix his life. Mm -hmm. And he looks okay. downright terrifying. <laughs> it's uh, I am at least fair enough to realize that some of my issues with this book, this one is at least completely me. And I, it's just, yeah, I know it, that. Th it's i think it's fine to be upset about it because it's like a very striking detail that is very much thrown away right mm -hmm. and as a as an audience i sort of go like hey if you're gonna make a big deal out of that i i want to know about it right mm -hmm. but I, I i i think it also i think it also comes just from doing stand-up too much and just what one of the quickest ways newbies fail at stand-up is they'll give these ridiculous premises but have none of the skill to pull it off and what is yeah. this more than, you know, a, a premise? A, a guy walks in looking all weird. So, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, no, I agree. I, I I also didn't, I don't think I ever remember laughing when I read that section. I, it, it doesn't really, like, there are sections of the book that I, as I was saying, I find quite joyous or that I laugh at. This isn't mm -hmm. one of them. It always just sort of like, oh, that's like, that's pretty wild. Okay, yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thrust offhandedly mentions that Yolanda and Clinette are taking meals in their rooms and avoiding windows to not get noticed due to the Canuck they allegedly demat. This is Gately's first confirmation that at least one murder did occur. Gately it wasn't his fault. <laughs> yeah. Gately blinks like mad, but Thrust just continues. Um, t -t 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 -t. Bruce Green hasn't said one word one about his feelings regarding Lens, though it's telling that he's suddenly screaming and thrashing in his sleep. No, that, but that, well, he's screaming and thrashing in his sleep, at least partially about mm. his, the story with his mother, which is because right. he's he's screaming about nuts and snakes. Mm. Right. I forgot that was his mom. OK. OK. Yeah. His. So and that is one of those moments that was just like too crazy to be real. But I remember just being like, this is awful. And I'm laughing at the whole like death because of exploding snake can thing. Mm. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Really awful and hilarious. Yeah. So. Um. So detail that's going to come to pass, I think. A bunch of cartridges came down from Enfield, but the staff aren't allowing anyone to watch anything yet until they're all been screened for content. Yep. And again, just another throw. We, we, we've heard that building up, though. We knew that was happening in the background. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we heard it in, in the previous section, which I guess actually happens later when Hal went to the house to... Um... Yes, they were... Pat, Pat and Johnette were having that discussion as yeah. Hal came in. Yeah, so. so it's sort of just like closing a loop about where those came from exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, Gately just wants Thrust to leave. While his pain is more manageable with somebody else in the room, it's primarily due to being distracted by having so many questions and being unable to ask them. He panics a little at the new... Th this I found adorable. Uh, just because at this point, Thrust is just giving him random details about what he's missing. And yeah. Ga Gately panics a little at the news that somebody else is doing the cooking. Well, which, they know course, to put cornflakes in the meatloaf for It's texture. about the texture. <laughs> If the texture doesn't work, the meatloaf doesn't work. And if the meatloaf stops working, the whole machine falls apart. I find it so charming about Gately and it always makes me laugh. Everything with his cooking makes me laugh. Like the I, whole uh, joke of like, will the, will the pasta be soft, Tommy? Or whatever, whatever their little joke. Oh, leave your teeth at home, hon. And they like go down. <laughs> The, the the perfect description they put in there, the perfect descriptor they had of Gately cooking was that every meal he was like a new bride cooking the first meal for the new husband. Yes, I could just so I could just picture big leering like with a fucking apron, just like, oh, I hope they like it. <laughs> it's every Disney, like every Disney comedy with the dad's formula right uh -huh. is that the dad is like cooking and they do and doesn't know if the kids are gonna like it or whatever it's like mm -hmm. it's so stock oh, and, for and some there, reason... there, there is also the great payoff when he notices his leftover meatloaf is going missing from the fridge and he goes like <laughs> they're really liking it and of course it's lens murdering dogs <laughs> guys i'm full of shit this book is fucking hilarious i just have a memory problem <laughs> i knew it I yes can't defend, i can't defend i'm wrong i fucking brought him hilarious. back I brought him back to remember what's funny about the book. Paul That's Dykeman, <laughs> episode 28. Market, market. It's uh, I'm, I'm, I was wrong about something. 
All right. Fantastic. I mean, I, I'd be happy just ending right there, but no, let's finish this section. Let's get, cause there's, we still haven't gotten to like, there's so much detail here. Oh yeah. I gotta, all right. I'm going to just like, I'm going to try and just be more like, yes, that's yes. I agree. Right. And no, let, something... let, let, let's just, let's get through this section until we get to the big check. Um, Sorry, listeners. You are, you are very kind for putting up with my gap. Yeah. Go well, on. I, say, I also feel bad because I know I recorded a long intro this week too, but whatever. <laughs> oh, no. we'll Thrust, Thrust leans in and gets to the point. He tells Gately that Pat allowed almost everybody to speak to the police, not just BPD, but also some ONAN officials, given the fact that Nux are Nux. 110% all confirmed it was self-defense on Gately's part. The only issue is they can't seem to find the gun that was used to shoot Gately. With Green being the last one, it seems to have seen it, saying he took it from the nuck and dropped it on the lawn while the girl stomped him to death. Clinette and Yolanda were not allowed down as the dead nuck had one of their spike-heeled shoes right through the eye and died on the spot. The shoe still affixed to the socket. Great visual. Finding, <laughs> finding the gun would be of great legal help to both Gately and Yolanda to prove that these nucks were aggressive, serious business. Everyone allowed their rooms to be searched voluntarily, but to no avail. Thrust suggests Gately start to thinking where it might have gotten to now for his own sake. And that's that little section right there. Whew. What a what an intense like rundown of that and it, mm. i mean like it also is just masterfully done that like right at the end because it's sort of like oh these things happened we brought you into the house like it's very at the beginning of of thrust talking about it it's like sort of relaxed and it ramps up to the end of like wait there's a dead one? Oh no there's a thing missing oh my god mm -hmm. one of them is dead with a spiky heel through his eye okay that's pretty much all of it right like i i just want to i just want to appreciate the phenomenal like how it felt as you were ex as i was reading it mm -hmm. as gately was being told it i was totally with gately being like what oh no and mm -hmm. I, I just think it's really interesting that he's getting all of this input that he can't respond to because this is very parallel to what it's like as a reader oh, right yeah. well like, also we're, we're getting a lot of information but we're still not getting all of it like we know that one of them was murdered, but we don't know about the two Gately was more hands on with. Yes. Exactly. And now, and now we have the new introduction of the missing gun and what, yeah. you know, that, that does to the entire, what, what does that do to all of this? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like really, it's really fascinating. And it is just such a great example of fiction doing what fiction can do mm -hmm. that we're getting that story, getting this story in that way. So. Okay. So I, I have my notes for the next section, 827, 845, right at the top. I have, we finally get to the fireworks factory. Um, <laughs> the fireworks factory. <laughs> all right. So later in the day, Gately wakes to see Jeffrey Day in the same position that Thrust had been in, eating an ice cream sandwich the nurses were giving out. <laughs> Gately does not care for Day. Day yeah. supposedly has a mentally handicapped brother with a phobia of leaves, and Day now feels guilty for having tormented the boy, threatening him with leaves. Gately notes he's been in demand as a, a conversation partner since he's become mute and mostly paralyzed. Yep. To see <laughs> Everybody ghostish. wants to talk to him. Yep. He continually <laughs> sees ghost as apparitions at his peripherals. Hmm. Um, so Gately has a recurring dream during sobriety of a tiny Asian woman looking down on him. He now yeah. has another dream where the ghostish figure stays still long enough to focus on a tall man with glasses and a sunken chest leaning against the wall with his ankles crossed. The ghost wears flood pants and Gately remembers the kids that would get that would get bullied at his schools looking similar. And Gately feels remorse, wondering if this was one of those kids his friends beat up and Gately did nothing to prevent. The ghost, hearing his thoughts, responds, no, just your generic garden variety wraith. That's this is that moment that you go, what? Like, I, I just have a sort of like note next to it and I've circled the page just being like, this is the moment it gets weird. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. If we finally have the ghost of James and Candenza, or possibly just a, hallucina a hallucination of Gately. I, I've read some people theorizing that Gately is dying here and we're getting a whole Jacob's Ladder where he's picturing this, which I haven't finished the book yet, but still, I don't think that really reads because he has no connection to James and Candenza. Why would he have it? If this is him in the throes of death, it, it doesn't make sense. Basically. Well, he, I mean, I guess there could be an interpretation that because he is on his way to death, death is talking mm. to him. Right. Uh -huh. You could say it's sort of that, that it's not that he is he is visualizing it, but that like he is he is like one foot out the door. Right. But I, I don't know that that's exactly it, because there are other things in the book that that I think read in a different make it read in a different way mm -hmm. than that. Um and we can, I, I don't know that I want to talk about them right now because there are still things coming that I don't want to give <laughs> yeah. away. So um, in my personal interpretation is that 
essentially Dave Foster Wallace is suggesting that in this universe that he has made, this is an option for dead people that they mm. can, they can, they can come they back slow- this way. Well, that maybe this is just how they die, right? Like th- that you, you're dead and you move at the speed of quanta, your spirits just flitting mm-hmm. around. And those who have the incredible willpower to slow down could speak to someone who is also not being distracted by anything. Okay. Okay. I, okay. I, th- I, I, that, I know it feels outrageous, but I think he's just suggesting like, that's the way it works. Like that's what happens when you die. Okay. That's okay. how I read it. But I've heard I've heard worse afterlives like the <laughs> well, like that like the childhood one I was brought up to believe in in which there was a good chance I would be screaming forever in the fiery torments of hell at some point we don't have to do it right now because we still have section to get through I think this is a good time for anybody who's reading this to like speak to whoever you're reading it with as a book club so we should have the conversation of like what do you think happens when you die what does that mean about what you think the spirit is Ugh. let's 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 just drop a little pin in that so we finish the details gotcha. and then okay okay, okay. we okay. can come back to that idea because I do want to ask that ask you that question okay let's leave the small details like the eventual destiny of our immortal souls and let's get back to infinite jest okay yeah woo! <laughs> <laughs> the important stuff that's right Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the race starts talking to him, but it takes oh, a while yeah. for Gately to like get that, right? Yeah. Like he's still in and out. He's he's thinking. He actually says here, "This is the first dream he's had with the full awareness that it was in fact a dream." Mm-hmm. Um, the Wraith is a bit world weary telling Gately, "Stop wasting your energy and my time trying to figure this out and just listen." Which big callback to to the crocodiles and all of AA. Like, stop yeah. thinking how it works. Just shut up and do it. Yeah, uh, it's taking yeah. the Wraith quite a bit of energy just to stay still long enough for Gately to see him. Gately notes the Wraith was very tall, but not in a spooky way, a natural way. There's a line here that I love. He has hunched shoulders and a lot of nostril hair. The line I love, something about the specificness of this apparition disturbed him. Yeah. And I, I get that because when I think of like horrific things like, oh, is this my imagination? Like, but. Say say you saw a ghost and like, oh, am I dreaming? What's happening? But then you notice the ghost has like a fucking tribal tattoo. And you're like, yeah. I wouldn't make that up. Why is that? Right. there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The specificness. Yeah, disturbed him. I agree. It's a great line. And it also gets around to something that I want to say later, which, you know, I was saying that Gately being in the hospital bed is parallel to our experience as a reader. Mm-hmm. Like we're getting told stuff and can't respond. This is now an additional deeper parallel. Gately is immobilized. And there's a thing thinking in his head, mm. which is exactly the way we are reading this book. Dave Foster Wallace is putting these words in our brain. <laughs> mm. And like, so there's this weird meta fiction thing going on. Okay. Yeah. That I, that I think is a really interesting, um, just like demonstration Ugh. of like layers of, of what I mean, it means. If you, if, if you want to take it further, fucking the, the apparition of a man speaking beyond the grave from a suicide, speaking us to all, I mean, obviously that took on new levels after, yeah. All those events beyond the publishing. But yeah, you can definitely read that very metatextual. Yeah, there's like this there's this thing happening that I think asks us to reflect on like what we're doing as we're reading this thing, what sort of experience we're having and like what it means to be like what it means for us as, as people to be in this sort of relationship with this text. Right. So anyway, okay. just, um, just a little footnote. Yeah. The Wraith, expl- uh, the Wraith explains that typically Wraith zoom about at incredible quanta speeds and assures Gately, no, you don't need to know what quanta means and that it takes an incredible amount of control to stand still. Normally, this isn't a problem because no Wraith really has reason to confer with a mortal. Also, Wraiths don't so much speak, but appear in someone's head as an inner monologue or intuition deal. To Wraith, humans move around at the pace that a clock hand moves. So just to give a little bit of a preview for the the death thing, my hope is, oh, well, why doesn't anybody come back from death to tell us what's going on? I really do think that if, if they do, they consider this life like, like it would be like, oh, well, why haven't you gone and played with the kids at the playground lately? Like, cause I'm, uh-huh. I'm past that shit. That would be, I, I think it's probably a faux pas in the spirit world to go back uh, and be a ghost. It's like, yeah, hey, you're still, you're still doing that. God, aren't yeah, you sick of that place? Yeah. It's just, maybe it's just not interesting. That's an interesting theory. Okay, cool. Let, let's keep getting details yeah. because, because there's just so much in what this race says to Gately mm-hmm. that helps unlock like big swaths mm-hmm. of the text, right? right? Like it's a great section that mm-hmm. if you are reading it, read it again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause it's, um, it's good. Real quick. Just another point to show that I'm full of shit. Gately thinks to himself, Jesus, even fucking ghosts are stopping to tell me their troubles now, which is very funny. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, <laughs> oh. 
almost a show off uh, how this works. The wraith begins disappearing and reappearing in different points in the room and broadcasting all unknown words at Gately, like pirouette and scopophilia. There's also a Coca-Cola can that the wraith is holding on Gately's forehead that has oriental writing on it. Yeah, it's, it's what's just up the giant. It's a Chinese can. He went to he went to China, got it, oh, or, or okay. went to or or went to Chinatown in Boston. Who knows? And got mm. a kula like a like it. So it has it has the writing uh, in Chinese for okay Coca-Cola okay on it. Yeah, okay. which I've seen because I've been in China. Anyway, Ooh. so that, well, la di da, Mister. La di da. I understood this part of Infinite Jest. So yeah, yeah. that's what a life. Uh, Gately wonders if this isn't some weird idea of his personal God in his own head, like AA founder Bill W's blue light from his last detox that he believed to be God. The Wraith yeah. reads this thought and Gately said, smiles sadly and responds, don't, don't we both we wish, wish young wish. sir? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait gosh. to be old to start calling people. I've already started calling teenagers young man. <laughs> it it young feels good. Sir. It does. So I, and so the, the, the thing that's really interesting about that is also that Gately starts to wonder if it's the apparition of his, of his uh, spider, of his disease. Right. Right. So he is, he is trying to discern if this thing he's experiencing is God, the devil, or some combination thereof. Right. Yeah. This is the, hmm. this is the trial of his soul, but he's sort of making it up because the Wraith is like, I'm not either of those things. Stop it. But Gately's <laughs> like, <laughs> So, right. Yeah. All right. Gately is frustrated at his inability to speak, and the Wraith responds, "He can personally identify with that impotence, which pisses Gately off because uh, he. I'm not impotent. <laughs> yeah. The Wraith mentions something about sitcoms, and Gately thinks about how a drug addict's second biggest addiction is always their home entertainment unit. I mention yep. this only because I love that he has the line about Cheers, quote, featuring the latter day stacked brunette and the early eps with the titless blonde. Yeah, and his relationship to Cheers like deepens after that because he says like he thinks of Nor- Nom Norm. What I, is his he, name? I, I, he must have misheard that because I know the character's name is Norm. Norm. Yeah. Maybe maybe uh, it's a Britishism. Like yeah, Nam. Oh yeah, maybe he just. I mean, a Britishism, it. Bostonism. Right. Exactly. I was, the the R. I, 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 I mistook the England I was discussing there. New England, <laughs> the new one, not the yeah, yes. not the old one. <laughs> but so he he has this like deep personal identification that he he imagined that character to be his father. Mm-hmm. Right. So well, it's, I, it's, I, I also just love the note that like because he was like everybody else in his life and that he was this big, loud, always drinking guy. Yet he magically never beat the shit out of anybody and got violent because it was a TV show. Yeah. Right, because and this is part of the, the lie of those TV shows is mm-hmm. they're always drinking. Like you think about how I met your mother; they're always in the bar. Yeah, and a their finances can handle that, and b they're not none of them are alcoholics, right? Like somehow, like they're just like doing the social thing, drinking, <laughs> and you know, like it's it's sort of this lie of television that has consequences. So the wraith, as if Gately remembers the extras on the show, people who I, I really like the framing and descri- description of this. Uh, the extras that you see in the background of any TV show, I think Seinfeld is the first one that comes to mind, just the people in the background who are talking, their mouths moving moving and nothing coming out. The Wraith says this is what his life was like, just out of the corner of the eye of his loved ones, non-communicative, a crummy way to live. Um, Wraith said when he made films back in his own life, he made damn sure they were either silent or everybody was audible, like in real life. And there's a comment here where he just talks about how strange it would be like, even if in one of those TV shows, somebody in the background suddenly stood up and started making noise, it would only like it still wouldn't be about them. The rest of the show would go on without them with everybody else commenting like, oh, that was weird that that happened. Right. Yeah. So just living on the margins of one's own life. Yeah. And that anything that you try to say gets turned into like, oh, like a, an event, a footnote in the other larger thing. Right. Right. Which just to remind you of how the book started is how the book st- is how it starts, right? Uh-huh. Hal responds and he is sort of like, well, this kid's out of control and like is shipped off, right? Right. And to, the, to the hospital. And so like, it's just interesting that, that that sort of image of like the lone person trying to express is somehow by the structures around them processed as something that is like out of control, needs to be put mm-hmm. away and will just at most be like the inciting incident for the rest of the stuff that's to go on. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, the Wraith says he's been trying to be noticed by Gately for three weeks, which is Don's first real indication how long he's been in the hospital. No, it's the Wraith equivalent of three weeks. Oh, like, okay. We, Gately still doesn't know how long he's been there, but it's oh, for, okay. for, in Wraith time, it's three oh, weeks. Oh, well, then that's, then that's probably infinitely longer considering how slow we move to them. Well, no, no, no. So in, we, yeah, we don't. Oh, like, wait. What, duh. Fucking yeah, duh. So you get okay. it now. You get right, it now. I got it. 
because no, because I'm with you. It's kind of I'm also like Gately trying to figure out how long has he been there. We don't know how long it has been. Mm-hmm. There, there are enough clues that you could probably make rough estimations. Mm-hmm. Like one is that when Gately arrives in the hospital, there is somebody in one of the other beds who has a box on his head. Gately just knows it's a box, right. which is the consequences of Eshtaton, right? Right, Otis Lord. And then and Otis Lord leaves at some point while Gately's in the ward. Okay. So we there's like enough that you can have a sense of how it'll fit. You know what happened? You know that Gately's in the hospital when Hal goes to the house, mm-hmm. right? Because okay. Gately's not there, and, and the the cartridges are there. So like, there's enough that I think you can rough in when it is. And I feel like if somebody wanted to be like real specific, they could probably <laughs> narrow it to a window. But we only know that in however wraith time works, it has been three weeks in wraith time. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Gately has the thought that he wished instead of all the rehab people, his sponsor, Crocodile Ferocious Francis G, would stop by. The Wraith says, excuse me, and then disappears for the blink of an eye, reappearing to say he visited Francis, and judging by his shaved and his ironed shirt, he may be on the way shortly. Isn't that so nice? That's like the nicest thing that this that has been done for Gately recently. Yeah, like the just, like, just, just checking in for you. Like, let me, you know what, let me, let me go run that errand for you. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a, it's a nice thing that he did. Especially considering all these people coming to him just to talk to him. This is the first buddy who's, who's really done anything for him. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's nice. Um, the Wraith says in his life, he lived to see his youngest become a figurant, a character off to the side, just like the Wraith himself. Mm-hmm. That it was a true horror watching your own offspring, watching open their mouth and nothing come out. This is where I get a little confused because I know it's been said over and over again how... Hal is like this shrinking little person coming more and more away, but we see him interacting with like Pemulus and Oxford so often that like, I almost feel like that doesn't read, especially considering that he truly doesn't become one of my confusions early in the book is we have the book that starts with him being uh, unheard by that admissions group. And then a little bit later, we see the professional conversationalist meeting where his father tries to talk to him, but like those are two, like one happens chronologically at the very end and the other one happens years before, but it almost seems to be happening at the same time. I don't know if that's just something with me. I'm just, I'm not seeing as much of him being hidden like this. Yeah. Here's my, here's my sense of it. And this might be me um, as the Wraith does projecting my own life onto Uh, hell. Okay. I think what we're seeing there cuz i don't i don't think what what incandenza never managed to just clarify that he meant he's not actually saying that hal is not speaking what he's mm-hmm. saying is that hal is not coming out like hal ha- hal has learned how to amaze everyone around him mm-hmm. like remember the the thanksgiving dinner where yeah. the young hal is like does anyone want to hear the definition of da 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 like right. hal knows how to impress his mother who's whose adoration he craves right so he can and he know and he thought that what would make his father happy was being really good at tennis so he's really mm-hmm. good at tennis so he's memorized the dictionary and he's the be- almost the best at tennis right mm-hmm. however what the father wants is to know how hal actually is mm-hmm. what hal actually is experiencing okay. and wants Okay, and, this, and, this actually makes a lot more sense now that because we have the only person we, we have Oren comment on how he's learned to satisfy the mom and nobody else. Whereas I feel with Jane, all right, I, I have this recontextualized now. Where with, as with James looking at it, like Oren's just the older brother, he's just like looking as he would as a brother. Whereas James has seen his own devolution, he's seen Oren go down this own weird path, and now he's seeing it having to howl in an even stranger circumstance. So he's actively mourning and concerned concerned about it whereas Oren really wasn't yeah yeah he with Oren he yeah because Oren is like mani- like Oren is almost like sort of all of the things that are happening to him on the inside are on the outside it's very clear he like right. seems to like have very simple wants and gets at them and is almost like too painful to try to talk to because he is like so desperate for approval mm-hmm. and and so very clear about his desperation for approval even though he thinks he's suave anyway the problem that the father has with Hal is that he saw so much promise in Hal and he doesn't feel like Hal is like really genuinely communicating with him. Uh And so that's where, that's where we get this admission that the thing that consumed the last years of his life was trying Mm. to make a perfect piece of entertainment that would break this perfect piece of armor that Hal had built. Right. Just get him to cry out at the very least for more. Right. So we learn in this bit with the Wraith, the origin of the entertainment, it was, 
trying attempt, to communicate with his son. Yes, it was this desperation to pull his son out of that place. Mm. And so to tie in immediately with the before thing where he referred to his own life as a figurant yeah. in the background, uh, he seemed to be the only one in the family who noticed. And while he was like screaming and panicking about this, everybody else attributed this to him, to this being some feature of his alcoholism. Yes. So, uh, which it very well might also be. Yeah, right? like it's it, a little it, column A, little column B. <laughs> a little column A, little column B. Probably mm-hmm. both. Yeah. So, like, there's this generational problem where they are very successful and are not happy, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they get everything they want, and it is not actually them being happy or satisfied. Right. So that, yeah, that the, in that case, to tie into your thought that it's about the sins of the father, we're definitely seeing that. That mm-hmm. like what all himself wanted was that Hal would not have to go through this and Hal is right. going through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gately asked the Wraith if he tried to, if he was uh, in sobriety as well. The Wraith says he hated the meetings at Boston AA, that uh, the smoke made it all feel to him like a poker game in hell. <laughs> um, little detail. Gately has a wincing shoulder pain. So sickening. It knocks the Wraith off of his perch on the heart monitor. This makes yeah. Gately curious if the Wraith has to share his pain to mind meld like this. Yeah, it makes me think of mirror neurons. Like when you're really mm, identifying yep. with a piece of entertainment or really listening to a person, the same uh, neurons fire in your brain that, that they are experiencing, right? Right. Like this deep connection we are capable of having that I think really gets us out of ourselves is this ability like, oh, they're suffering and mm-hmm. I suffer too. Yeah. Oh, so just a little blip there. One of my quickest ways to decide if somebody is a pure fucking idiot. I've seen a few times of people online talking about these specific horror movies that I love. Uh-huh. And they and they say, like, that wasn't scary. I just laughed the whole time. And I immediately like, oh, so l- let me get this straight. You watched a horror movie at two o'clock in the afternoon with the windows open, looking at your phone the whole time and like, eh, it didn't even scare me. And it's like, oh, you weren't paying it. You weren't even trying to get in to what this thing was supposed to be. And yeah. now you're declaring that it failed at what it was because yeah. you're too fucking dumb to ever empathize with another person and think, oh, what if that was my mom? Which is what all that's what all horror movie is supposed to be. What if that happened to me? Boy, would yeah. that be scary? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think it's a really good litmus test for how willing people are to step outside of themselves right and when you are not willing to step outside of yourself everything else is very easily dismissed as irrelevant so it's like Mm -hmm. yeah whatever 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 but when you are willing and it's it is overwhelming to like really try and empathize with people around you Mm because it it can it can be it can be more weight than you can pull up on you know like do not let the weight you pull exceed your own like there is a way that empathizing with others can really uh it can can be be exhausting at a point yeah, but it is the muscle that's worth developing, I think. Oh, you're are you you're plugging in. Okay, okay. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, hold on. Is my did my microphone change? Yes. Fuck. Okay, you can still hear me though, right? I can still hear you. It's great. I think you <laughs> Okay, we're back after those technical difficulties. Um Yeah, a, a race swept in and screwed up our tech. And God we're back. damn race can't trust them as far as you can throw them, which isn't far we at all just... because they're not made of physical material. <laughs> we we can't throw them at all. They could throw us though, apparently. So, but yeah, we'll high more on that later. Fan. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Gately tries to figure out whether to take this wraith business at face value, or if it isn't all something symbolic of his own violent, non-communicative father figures, <laughs> like the retired MP who lived with them. Oh, geez. And this is such a Gately info dump about like what informed him as well mm-hmm. as a person, right? This MP is just a monster. Oh, yeah. And there's also the interesting thing that he's having an inner monologue right now, but with somebody else who's following the whole thing, too. Like we are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. DFW it. was a handsome genius and a martyr and a prophet. I've already decided that's how I'm going to label that episode in the Reddit post this week. DFW was a <laughs> handsome genius. We'll see what we got. <laughs> They'll think you're just pandering to their desires, but I think that's what like they want, Paul. That's, that's what, what they want. want. Well, if you're listening, we like you very much. We just wish you were less angry. That's guys, all. We're, okay. we're, we're, we're such nice guys, you know? I, I can speak for Jesse. He's a very nice person. Paul has <laughs> such a kind smile. You would not believe it on a non-video Because <laughs> my voice sounds mean. <laughs> okay. Focus, focus, focus. I have okay. to leave soon. 
Okay. Um, All right. Well, the, not retired, too soon, but. the retired MP who lived with them, who'd make Gately return the empty beer bottles to the recycling plant and time how long the trip took. The MP had never laid a hand on Gately, but had given his mother savage Navy style beatings that hurt like hell, but never bruised. Yeah. The MP was an obsessive record keeper, marking down all his beers, drank and bench presses, which Gately has long since realized was a crazy illusion of control. Yeah. Whenever the MP left the house, Donna's mother never mentioned him as if the idea of him vanished as he walked out the door. Yeah. Don wishes he could have asked his mother if she ever loved this man or why she kept him around when he beat her every single day. Gately feels a pang of guilt that he never even thought to pull the MP off of his mother, even when he'd grown larger and stronger than the guy. But he didn't even yeah. feel anything about it, would often just turn up the TV or go lift weights. Something about the whole ordeal seemed to just not be his business. Yeah. Um, the MP. Yeah, had just, a- like in, just like when uh, he's talking about the flies that the MP would hit. Yep. And that Gately, can't, Gately desperately is trying to remember did I ever like do Put anything? them out of their misery? Right. Did I do anything? Yeah. Yeah, because it somehow seems really important to him to determine, like, if as a kid he did that, which I just think is really interesting. Like, yeah, like maybe as a kid he didn't, but he could change how he feels now. But it's for some yeah. reason he fixates on like it. I must have in order for me to believe I'm I have I'm a good person or something. Where right. anyway, it's and just this is also this is also a direct allusion to a few pages ago where he first sees uh, in Candenza the Wraith and says, oh, is this symbolic of those kids my friends beat up that I didn't do anything to help? Yeah. And yeah, obviously yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing him in this position though, because he got shot fucking protecting the fly once. Yeah. So, yeah, he got shot for the one time that he decided to do something, mm-hmm. which is also very interesting to think like, yeah, the one time you try to actually help, this is the, this is the shit you end up in. Yeah. Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? Well, it's the consequence. Like the reason we avoid it is because it could have consequences. Oh, but yeah. if we want to do the right thing, we have to also put up with the consequences of infection and wraith chat. Yeah, no, I had uh, God, I had this like a year or so ago. I um, I was walking into a Staples to get something and I'd seen a guy like smacking his small child. And like in that moment, I just had a kind of like for whatever reason i just had i i I'm obviously wanting to save the kid but then you have that immediate it's on the one hand you feel like a coward but on the other hand you really are juggling in your head like that's still that guy's kid if i jump in and do anything or say anything right now who's to say he's not going to take that kid out in the parking lot and just bash his skull against a telephone pole because he has nobody else to take it out on which is you know a valid thought but at the same time how much of it is it a valid thought and me being a coward yeah, so. it's very it's it's the challenge of life to figure that out, to like figure out the limits of, of our action and exactly. what we should or should not do. Yeah, I'll tell you when I wasn't a coward, when I yelled at the old lady without the face mask and the IGA the other day. Good for you. That's Look at right. that. Enforcing enforcing our pandemic rules. Go right. for that. I, I left that IGA and immediately ran up the rocky steps because I am a hero to the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, because when you have the CDC behind you, you're ready to ready to fight. But without that, <laughs> uh, it's going to be such well, a brutal winter. Anyway, I yes, yeah, for sure. Uh, Everyone, stay safe out there. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and do whatever you can to stay inside. Okay, exactly. going back into the the MP. The, the MP had a disturbing method of dealing with flies in the house. The man had yeah. fast hands, fast enough to strike a fly but not kill them. He'd then tear <laughs> off a wing or a leg and leave the fly to suffer. He told little Don that humans couldn't hear, but the fly would scream in pain and the other little flies would know to stay away. Gately remembers putting his giant child head to the table, trying to hear the scream. He can't remember whether he put any of them out of their misery. He then imagines him doing the same to the knuck. He'd smash their face against the windshield, leaning in to hear its screams. Mm. Gately awakes to see three of the crocodiles next to his bed, asking if he's still sober and saying it's good. He's still on this side of the sod, which is a great lie. Um, yeah. They ask who the tall piggy man outside his room is. He looks to be settled in for a long stay with coffee and magazines. Gately is terrified at the vague recollection of a rather piggyish looking district attorney. Who the has cro- a fondness for third world takeout. <laughs> there you go. The crocodiles tell cheesy al jokes that Gately has to pretend to laugh at. So they'll just leave. Yeah, and those are my notes for this week. That's that's a really great rundown of everything that happened. And yeah, it's because it is just like there are there are several big sort of releases of information in sort of an ironically, uh, ironically in a situation where Gately is forced to not be able to ask any questions about it. Like we Mm. just get, 
we just get loads of like this is stuff right? right we get loads of like what happened to gately after like what happened after he was shot and passed out we get tons of information about uh what is happening with hal and the entertainment in the form mm -hmm. of what the wraith says and we get lots of gately's backstory That's sort right. of all in these flashbacks dreams memories wraith speaking and people talking to him and mm -hmm. it's very dense uh, but it's like really, I think a really rewarding section because of how much we have not known up to this point. Right. I, I like how much they've filled in just in like the last 60 pages or so, just on the entertainment itself, yeah. where now from uh, Molly Notnick last week, we got all the details on what is in the actual film itself. But now we yeah. also have the motivation, which is important because a lot of Incandenza's work. I mean, he's expressing something, but he's also just kind of dicking around for a lot of it. So, yeah. To hear the intention of what it was supposed to, I mean, the fact that he was trying to reach out to his son and now this weird mother figure is, it, it, it didn't work with his son, but is reaching out to other people so much that it's fucking killing them. I know, right? Such a, such an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a great moment where the Wraith, Gailey is obviously not curious but the wraith is like you must be dying with curiosity to know if i succeeded making something so entertaining <laughs> yeah. and it just it just goes totally by the wayside oh god so it's yeah anyway it's there it's a great section it's one that's worth reading again to like get more of that detail out of it because i mm -hmm. think there is just like there are all these little nuances and but also just to know so much about like where gately's like um gately's ability to like compartmentalize comes from mm -hmm. like because as a kid he had to sort of go like okay they are making noise and I'm just going to turn it off and go do something mm -hmm. else. Right. Like, Oh, I, I also, I completely skipped over the detail that he would also overhear them fucking in the next room. Yeah. And the sounds of her being beaten and getting railed sounded very similar yet. He somehow knew one was bad and the other one wasn't, but yeah. I would also say, even though it's not said lightly there, I mean, even, even if you don't grow up in an abusive household, I think the one thing that everybody has some experience with of compartmentalization is doing your best to ignore the sounds of a loved one getting fucking plugged up or doing the yeah. plugging, doing the plugging. Yeah. It's because it is, it is, all, it is, it can be a symbol of dysfunction and there is an element of like a certain amount of compartmentalization is necessary mm -hmm. for function. Ooh, and that's it, also very important when we have uh, the, the perceived or rumored incest between Avril and Oren, which is, and I, I only know this because, Oh, are you not I, aware of that theory? I, I don't think it's a, a correct theory, but okay. it's, I, I mean, she's incestuous, but it's, it's with Tavis. Like right. it's, it's, it's I, I, with Oren though. I don't, I feel like that is like a bit of a, a bit of an exaggeration of, of what it is, is that or Oren inherits from his mother, her sort of like, sexual um proclivity what's the proclivity but it's less of a proclivity and more of a, a necessity she has to do it it's a procavity procavity <laughs> there's a word that i'm missing it's not a fetish it's a a compulsion that's the word i'm looking for proactivity. he inherits i don't know i'm just throwing peas out there he inherits a compulsion from uh -huh. her right and so he ha he he has the same compulsion but i don't know that that is clear indication that th that there was actual incestual relationship there like i so the, i would the, have the, to the theory the theory of that i've heard is remember she had uh thinking that james had had an affair with joelle avril had an affair, avril had an affair with somebody in the back seat of the car and had yeah. written something in the fog and apparently the theory had been when that name reappeared on a foggy day in candenza saw that and then went and killed himself so if you think if you think mirror images that she thinks James is fucking their son's girlfriend. Yeah. The thing is, it's, a, it's that not something I, I haven't finished the book yet, so I don't ascribe to it. It's just something I've heard yeah. from very early on. It's, it certainly is interesting. I guess maybe there's some thinking about, cause I guess what else would he react to that strongly? The thing is that, um, that the other thing that I always had thought about that sort and maybe kind of lazily, it's it's it is indicated that Avril had been sleeping with other people a lot, and that right. uh, Incandenza himself had just never noticed, like he had just never observed it, and that was the first piece of like actual evidence that he received, okay. like because okay. he, he just hadn't been paying attention and didn't didn't it wouldn't even really he didn't re care I guess mm. I had always assumed that the person she'd been in the back of the car was with the, was the medical attaché, but I don't know. Oh. Uh, okay. Um, but okay. I don't know why seeing that name scrawled there would necessarily cause him to put his head in a microwave 
I there are also all these other questions that I have, which I don't think are all that relevant to what the book's actually about in terms mm. of like his head in the microwave bit. Like I just, I don't know that it actually all that matters all that much in terms of like our mm. read of the ultimate book itself. I just don't know how fruitful or helpful it is to think about Avril that way. I just don't know why it would be. I mean, I guess because it's like completing the Hamlet illusions because of sort mm. of the be the bedroom scene in Hamlet. Well, there, there, there is also that she's like so obsessed with mothering and trying to bring somebody in closer. Mm -hmm. And how much closer can you bring somebody in than when your bodies are actually together? Yeah, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility, considering like the incest that happens in other parts in the book, like in uh -huh. other in descriptions of AA trauma and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just to, to be honest, it was not it's not something that had ever struck me. And I okay. would wonder why it would be significant. I, I I'm definitely in the camp of like not thinking that and i will re-examine that when i go to read it next i just don't mm -hmm. even know that it has stopped me from appreciating the book on a deep level i, guess. I think i yeah. also i think i remember in the notkin chapter on the last episode i, th yeah. I think there might have been like a specific allusion to something uh, I, I i don't i don't remember it clearly okay. right now i'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it yeah so, let's I, I i sorry i just made a face because i was like i don't know that i'm really down for that anyway and i'm glad yeah. i had a chance because i remember hearing you talk about it in the podcast and being like huh, i don't actually know that i'm i'm down for that anyway yeah so anyway. what do you think happens when we die? Good question. So glad you asked. Um, I'll go first. The The thing I think that happens when you die, right? I don't know. I, I'm still sort of formulating my sense of like what we are spiritually. Like, I, I think it's something that has to be for, sort of like really carefully pondered and considered because it's a big question because mm -hmm. it informs the way you want to live your life. And I, I am starting to come to the opinion that there is like that there is energy that we are, right? And that we we exist in the world with that energy, and that when we when our the physical part of our existence passes, what's left is sort of this energy that is very that is very much the same as everything else. Like that animating energy is the, my animating energy is the same as yours, is the same as the dogs. It's just like wow. the life and the energy that is life, right? And it, it gets it rejoins that space, right? I think I get this from various images of like uh, how. What, what people talk about when they talk about like reincarnation and stuff and sort of my uh -huh. borderline understanding of that and a sort of like brief brief brushes with Buddhism and mixed in with like sort of a, a, a what the tradition I come from being one that like you die and your spirit goes somewhere. So I think I am I'm indicated in the direction of it like there being this energy, but I am not necessarily going the direction of like a soul with your personality. Um, and I am thinking of like, there is this energy that it is worth being in tune with because we will rejoin. Uh -huh. um, but it, that energy, that energy that makes me alive is not necessarily the one that has my personality. Okay. If that makes sense. It just is a, a an energy of the, of the universe. Right. So I don't know that my personality persists, but the energy and what I do with it might, and it will change it. So I, I, what do you think happens when you die? Well, here's my thing. I, uh, I don't believe uh, the way I put it to like religious family members is I don't believe in a personality God. I don't believe there's a God with an ego and an id that gives a f that created me or gives a flying fuck that I exist. I have hope that there's like a system. Yeah. In order that like, you know, yeah, you die. One thing goes somewhere, somewhere goes somewhere else. Uh, this is all based on the fact that I would very much like there to be something, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know. I had uh, so like a year and a half ago, my um, stepfather had a medical incident and was in a coma we had to pull the plug on him well and i was there and i got to well got to it makes it sound like i've been waiting in line for it for months i i got the ps5 also i, I got, got the gold i got the golden ticket yeah I, I got to unplug my stepdad but uh Oof. considering the level of brain damage we thought he was supposed to be like yeah the watching that actually happen actually gave me a lot of new spiritual shit because mm. he like he it really he shouldn't have been there like as he was dying he opened his eyes and i immediately had a fuck i shouldn't have been here because i thought i was about to watch this man that i've known since i was a, an infant die like a fucking dumb fish just wide-eyed that's yeah. not what happened he looked directly at my mother and he kept his eyes on her till like the last moment and then he looked off out the window in the corner and he closed his eyes and he was fucking gone there was a very big this wasn't a feel of like shutting down having yeah. seen the death in person it didn't feel like a shutting down and a flickering out it felt like a departing yeah so wow i wow. got my fingers crossed for that
Yeah, well, I think it's also interesting that like there is this desire to believe that there's something, but you also have the sense that there is there is a system. Something's going to happen. You have some faith that there is a there's a reason, and that reason will become clear in this. In that the, the line I've heard that makes me think about this is life itself doesn't make any sense. Like an afterlife makes just as much sense. Like yeah. why do why do we live in a world that's held together by very specific rules and theorems that can be proved with like numbers and shit like that why is it at all not just chaos like there's yeah. if anything the world has shown there is structure why yeah. why so i don't know i think that's a very nice thing to hope for and i think it's a good point to end this particular episode we've talked for a really is. long time <laughs> yeah we did yeah we did so it's a it's a very good section of text and i hope everyone's enjoying i hope i hope i hope you're enjoying your read through it and i'm i'd be very interested to hear what you think of what comes next because it's so i i can't wait to hear well, luckily you can hear every week on the i hate infinite jazz podcast right uh, here no, i'm uh i'm i'm very glad that just in a project thing i'm ready to get on to other things so yeah. I'm, I'm very ready to be done with this yeah. but i'm enjoying it and i am interested to see how it ends and as somebody who watches a ton of like analysis shit online yeah. or on youtube i'm looking forward to diving into that aspect of the fandom yeah you should do like a will you do like a post like i finished it watch yes. some analysis episode okay cool. I, I think i'm gonna what i'm gonna do is after the final episode summarizing everything you know mm -hmm. like uh like we're doing here that format i think i'm probably gonna have dan ostrov and steve clark on and my first two guests and the reason i started the podcast and we're just gonna cool summarize overall and discuss and then we'll move cool. on to other other things so great well, paul thank you as always you've been a pleasure yeah. you're one of my favorite guests on here glad to have you back it's I, been so good to be here thanks for thanks for all of it it's great remind us again where we can find you the offercast.com is my improvised podcast you can find it there and stream it wherever you get podcasts you can also find us on youtube we make up crazy stories we made up a telenovela the other day it was loads of fun Good time. Ooh, I like telling about yeah. us. All right, guys, go out and check the offer again, man. It would be nice. I feel like I've known you so long and I've only <laughs> ever met you through this computer screen twice now. Or the for the purpose of this podcast. For the yeah. purpose of we this podcast. We definitely got to meet. Yes, sure. it's going to happen. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you in the spring once we both get vaccines. <laughs> Let's get through this dark, hellish winter that's ahead of us with on the other side, the hope of shows and friends meeting who have only met. Virtually. Hell yeah. So, All right. Yeah. Buddy. Well, Thank you very much. I'll say what I always say. I'm going to stop recording, but you and I can keep talking. Later, bud. Okay. Peace.